something do you, no. do you need something can no, i get no, you anything no. <coughs> do you want a priest or rabbi <laughs> um in either case the latter. <laughs> in either case i think he needs a doctor instead the sun okay. shines that's more the sun sets and i'm sick again welcome to crash Course podcast um i will try and keep the sniffling coughing and sneezing to a minimum um, Rain or storm, we podcast anyway, right? That's true. Or, that's, or pun. Deafening, that's a pun. Deafening illness, that's yeah. a bad pun. Rain or storm. Steve doesn't know. Oh, yeah, good I was. Ma- I meant to go with like snowstorm, but you. But you're right. That came out as very redundant, didn't it? <laughs> um, I want to thank again, post episode for uh, after birth monkey for coming on. Uh, Chuck and Mark have been reaching out to me about how much they enjoyed the episode, so thank you guys. Um, also, a quick little thing for you guys. Because John left before I got to do it. Last night I went to Nerdy Oki, got to talk to Joe Rude for a bit, which is always fun. Um, Episode 36. Check him out. He's, and he's Good. coming back. He's coming back. That's So part one is big announcement. Our June guest will be Joe Rude. He's coming back at the end of the month. So keep an eye out for that. But while I was there, I decided for my cheesy 90s song to sing, which I always do at Nerdy Oki. Oh, God. I picked All Star. Uh, to reference two weeks ago to I episode left, yes. 94 is with Neil, Neil Cicero, Cicero. and then I song. tweeted at Neil about it saying it was in his honor um, the best part though of course was when I sang it I knew all the words obviously and everyone in the bar sang along ah, but did you did you sing a rendition of the way he did it no I just sang the, like, the song like was in, straight in the yeah. style of yeah. Mussorgsky's uh, pictures at an exhibition Psalm, 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 Psalm. no that wouldn't okay. well if you did so that I would be impressed but now I wasn't there so Body, I'll have to body, imagine body, that you were more impressive. Body, 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 body. body, body. <laughs> um, still, I, I, did, I, I did see you have your duet. Yes, I did Gorillas with a friend of mine, Alex D. Um, she did the rapping, I did the singing, because I don't rap. Though, uh, suddenly see, not suddenly see more, feed me. Oh, yes, Tyler Parker, former guest, episode... 13. He sang Feed Me Seymour with Joe Rude, Joe Rude being Seymour and him being the plant. And worked it was, very well. It, it, <laughs> Tyler can do an amazing Seymour. He was no, he, you mean an amazing I mean, Audrey amazing too? Audrey too, he, which was a lot of fun. Scary. He had the inflection down pat. Um, but yeah, so that was fun. It was great to get to go to the way station and do Nerdy Oki again and talk to Joe for a bit. He's dabbling with a few ideas for what album to bring. Uh, he had some suggestions. Also, not anytime soon because we're kind of booked, as it were. But hopefully before the end of the year. We will have Tyler Parker back as well. He expressed his interest to do our Disney episode, which we've been talking and teasing about. I would enjoy him on for the Disney episode. So, and his uh, his singing talent is appropriate for for Disney esque tunes. I um, think. Also, I want to plug with them being guests last week and recently digging up Tyler's performance. I'm going to be posting more audio clips, audio performances from the podcast onto the YouTube. So be sure to check that out. You'll be able to hear the brand new song from uh, Afterbirth Monkey, which you heard if you listened to the episode. Whenever you like, Cole took your boyfriend, um, and uh, I like took your boyfriend. It was they, they're you would like that. The, the thing the thing I like about Chuck and Mark is that they're a specific kind of personality that's very hard to not get along with. They're they're very they're very malleable and very very easy to get along with. And even though we talked over each other a lot last week. It was still enjoyable, and it was kind of funny to hear the separate conversations happening at once, and like peaks of the conversations come up at different points. There was a sort of I- inherent comedy to it. Yeah, I-, I wouldn't put on a pedestal, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, no, as that... the sound engineer, I, c- I couldn't in good conscience agree with you uh, completely. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, well it we... was it. You know, I was laughing the most when I was trying to hear what we said in the background because always one conversation was way over the other. Yeah. And in the background ones, I remember like we were there was. There was 
jokes going on that made me chuckle. Yeah. See, this is why the, the pending uploads of the podcast to YouTube might benefit us. Because then you just throw in those timestamps and be like, hey, at the, the old stupid little annotations yeah, that yeah, people yeah. do, we really get over each other. If you listen, you can hear four different conversations at this particular time. Yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. there's also the point where I still get upset at ironic Oh, the I song. I still get upset. The word that ironic? Song. Well, no, I oh, was oh, more said yeah. song ironic that isn't ironic at all. Yes. That's coincidental oh. at best. Um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so um, we'll, of course, keep you posted about when Joe will actually be on. We'll have dates and stuff as we go forward. Um, I'm also excited to announce we're going to do another fan recommendation this month, so that's coming as well. Um, Love them fan, Rex. Why don't we uh, get into our album, John? That you tortured me with this week. Pick of the I week. Did, we looked at him. I did not, in fact, torture Matt with this album. <laughs> I just brought on a very interesting piece. This week we did Swans. Their album, To Be Kind. Uh, the Swans is a band that has been around since... Just Swans. No, Swans. No, no, no. Not the... Not the... the Devican article. But Swans is a band that has been around since... Uh, 82... Uh, a little, a little later than a that. A little bit later than that. I think the first bill, billing was uh, actually about eighty-two. Uh, they, they, they were a post-rock, post-punk, noise rock, experimental band. Yes. Uh, they did break up back in the late nineties, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, and only recently got back together. Uh, Very recently, I was surprised to see them. To be honest. Now, the band's got. Six main members right now, but they've had over twenty different people. The main along. guy, as I know it, is Michael Jara. Yeah, Michael Jara is is the the, is the, the forerunner. He is the lead singer. He is and the lead uh, pushing, musician and composer. Pushing sixty years old, I believe, at the moment. Yeah, he's been around for a while. Yep. So actually, um, I don't doubt eighty two. Come to think of it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, singer, songwriter, and multi instrumentalist. He's he's done a lot. Uh. He did break up the band back in eight, uh, 97 and got back together only recently. This newest song is 12th album. Only the third since they got back together, but like the 12th or 13th album they've actually done. Yeah, they've had a lot. I, I'm familiar with a little bit of the work as per my old roommate, Daryl, who uh, back in college introduced me to Swans and all of the various related uh, noise rock bands. Um, and actually how they're kind of the forerunners of, of the genre in, in a certain way. They've influenced a lot of other artists that we've come to know. I, I, I have no doubt that they're uh, the father of, for instance, the Silver Mount Zion, which I brought on the podcast back in 80, uh, podcast 82. Now, Steve. Throwing a lot of numbers around. That's not their full name. If you're going to reference them, reference their full names. The Silver, the double E Silver Mount Zion Memorial Orchestra. No, wait. Was it? Did I miss a word? And wasn't it and something choir orchestra. and something choir and Tralala band with choir? But I think that dates from an earlier incarnation. Oh, of the is band it? I thought that was the version we <laughs> reviewed. I don't think they were the Tralala band with choir. In no, that no, they were. It wasn't no. the Tralala. Yeah, that oh, was okay. an earlier, earlier incarnation. Okay. Um, <laughs> my apologies. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, this particular album by Swans, um, to be is, kind, is. How oh, nice. Two hours and one minute long. Okay, yeah, let's okay. get down to brass tacks okay. here. Yes. It's a very, very long album. It's a double disc set, and we are, yes, doing both of these discs on the podcast. Because, because it's still a cohesive piece. You can't in good conscience really uh, uh, separate these. And it is only ten tracks. That's the thing. So, so the average length is twelve minutes. Yeah, it's a... um. It's a project unto itself. And, let's face it, double discs are not rare, although, granted, double discs with with he uh, some half an hour and then also 17-minute and some 12-minute tracks on them, they are a little rare. And they're definitely, they go hand-in-hand -in -hand with the noise rock genre, which love their time. The length of the tracks were so bizarre, I've actually written down the times of all of them. And we'll recite them as we go, because it's just odd why... Certain songs were They're a certain They're bizarre light. for the pop world, but remember, in the culture, this is very, very common stuff. And we are going to get into uh, long tracks later in the album, but I'm going to move through this. Uh, I do have one comment to say about Swans. I know that the name Swans comes from uh, Michael Jarrah's idea of the of, of a swan being a beautiful, elegant creature Yet. with a very bad temper. Yeah, but mean-spirited in the long haul. Exactly. And the, that was the sound he was going for. So, I would actually say they're quite appropriately named. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, he's been doing this since the 80s, as far as I can tell, based on the work that I had heard back in college, which obviously was their work probably from the early 90s. Um, I don't honestly hear too much of a difference in sound, except for certain little moments where they actually get a little bit jauntier than what I recall. But let's begin at the beginning, as we always do. Screenshot. This song was... Eight minutes and five seconds long. Okay. Um, it was also <laughs> an amazing introduction, and this is something we harp on for so many albums, I'll... but this may very well be one of the greatest introductory songs for any album we've reviewed. Um, oh, I wouldn't say in, in, not greatest introductory songs for an album, but this is one of my greatest, my, my most favorite, I think of what we've reviewed, my most favorite introductions to a song. Not necessarily to an album, but yeah. just the way in which this track begins is very alluring to me. I uh, noticed that initially it's driven by a very, very soft bass, just sort of slowly creeping along, creating this kind of haunting aura. And then the guitar here only steps in just as color. It's really just there to sort of a little pitter-patter here and there, but... It's also the percussion that drives it. That's another thing you have to accept with noise rock is that, you know, there's very little to latch on to in terms of chordal changes. So what you can latch on to is at least a nice, steady, but driving rhythm. So you get this here with a, a, a raw percussion, which in this case, every other beat sort of sounds like a cowbell to me. It's kind of, um, it takes you out of the music a little bit, which I think is actually a little bit haunting in itself. So this is what I'm getting out of, just the intro period. And then it gradually starts thickening out. And that was where I really started uh, enjoying the complexities they were doing. Because nothing really seemed like it was overstepping, st uh, overstepping its bounds. Everything felt like a natural progression in this complexity that they built. Yeah, when subtle changes. Subtle, subtle changes. It was uh, very much a repetition of a same theme, but the theme definitely f uh, fleshed out... And grew more complex as the song progresses. But that repetition wasn't wasn't overly repetitive. What I mean by that is, because it sounds redundant, is that it, it lent to a very hypnotic feel to the song. It had this Definitely. kind of rhythm that that really was entrancing. And when the vocals come in a little later, it, it lends to that. The way he sings in the song, he kind of croons, which is a, song, a singing style we'll get more of later, and I really like. Yeah, he dipped back and forth between a couple of singing styles in this album, but you're right, I would definitely uh, use one of those styles as a crooner voice, which is interesting coming from noise rock. But either way, it is, it's, it's not terribly melodic. It's still, I think, used as an instrument uh, unto itself. Uh, just this, so it, It's obviously the lead focus, but it's not... Um, I'm not even sure I really call it the essence of the music. For instance, what you mentioned about repetition. I, I think it's redundant or repetitive to, I guess... Uh, harp on repetition when it comes to a genre like noise rock, which really lends itself to uh, to basically placing you in a zone, which it uses the capacity of time in order to do. It's something you just kind of have to accept going in. And, well, since Swans began the genre, they're clearly very adept at it. But don't expect in every single instance to be bored, although sometimes it's unavoidable. But here, at least as an, as an introductory track, I wasn't feeling it yet. I think this was noise rock at, at its peak right here. Oh, I it, would... it creates, it, it creates a, a setting, and it, it paints like brush strokes with the color that it inserts here and there, this, this pitter-patter of guitar work. Very interesting. Well, yeah, the nuance of the guitar mixed with the hypnotic drum rhythm is really what paints that clear picture. And and I didn't think this track was boring or repetitive at all. I again was very much moved with the rhythm. I thought that the the, the flow pulled pulled you along very well. I think that was because this one seemed to lead a little more towards the psychedelic as opposed to the experimental rock. It definitely yeah. had a. I felt like it had a much older feel, uh, closer to the late seventies as opposed to. The later 80s, when, when noise rock was really in its heyday. I, I'll, I'm hesitant to really dip too far back into the past, because, I mean, granted, even though I just said that I don't think what he's doing is, is terribly different from the 90s, I still think there was a lot going on there in the 80s that sort of distinguished this style of rock, rock from the style of rock that you were getting back in the 70s. So it, any, any similarities that I would find with psychedelic rock would be incidental. 
um, such as, for instance, the fact that they definitely like long tracks. Uh, they definitely like painting a picture in their own way. But the styles, the fundamental styles, I think, are very different. Also, you're going to get more, I think, intricate work on, on psychedelic rock uh, than here. Yeah, there were a lot of moments of nothing in places, or what seemed like nothing, to be truly that kind of psychedelic rock. Yeah, I know. But then again, I... I it's funny, I did use the word intricate for the drum work here, at least as it gradually starts progressing in this track. It, it, it starts out very straightforward, but it does get more intricate, but yet it still manages to kind of to take a back seat. In fact, I would say there's very, much, there's very little in the foreground until he starts singing, and even that is really more of a chant than a melody, which is kind of what I was saying before. It's not, kind of just this continuous rhythmic motif that he does with his vocals with varying lyrics here. And let's just take a look at some of these lyrics. Love, child, reach, rise. Sight, blind, steal, light. Now this and then is... into no pain, no death, no fear, no hate. This is very much a stream of as, consciousness. As I said, it's just pe- re- repeated in that, in that rhythmic uh, motif. And yeah, I, I could kind of accept a stream of consciousness here, although I don't think the words are arbitrarily chosen. No, that is definitely true. They are not just chosen, but their placement is is pointed for the message that's that's trying to be established here. Also, there's an interesting thing with the, with these words, and I think this is going to come back at us uh, later in this album. But I believe many of these words are are what we find echoed uh, down at the end of this first disc. Um, in the case of the track, uh, Some Things We Do. Well, and it's some, not just, not just this Some Things back. We Do. Not just there. These, uh, I guess simplistic is the best way to put it. It's it's more along the writing style of beat poetry than anything else. But even there, you get you know prepositions oh, yeah. and verbs. This itself is just idea spouting. Yeah, well, actually, that could very well be beat, tr- beat poetry. I don't think that's a... That's a um, that's an incorrect way of, of sort of summing this up. In in many ways, you could consider this to be his style, a, a sort of beat poetry superimposed over brushstrokes. Which, again, the brushstrokes are pretty intricate at this point. I'm, there I am using the word ag- again, so actually I, I, I'm not going to steal that word away from noise rock. Uh, especially later in this album... The guitar kind of takes a little more of a front seat. It's not just color at this point. It sort of steps in with these these distant screams, which is where we get the kind of eeriness that this that I think really defines this track. The, the guitar can really swell at time. You get these these volume swells, which uh, are prevalent throughout the album, but I really notice them here. It it lends itself to creating a little more of a frantic, eerie quality as opposed to just an unsettling. Uh, slower pace from its uh, first introduction. Yeah. It, it it seems to raise the energy without really letting you out from underneath the spell it's trying to create. That's actually not a bad way of putting it. I, I, I see that. And actually I see that also later here with the instrumental. I say instrumental a little bit loosely because instrumental in this sense, probably just the second he stops singing, which he, you could really say speaking. But... It's a continuation of the same groove. It adds a little bit of piano, I believe, which repeats the same groove, and th- there it kind of starts to sound like the soundtrack to a B-movie, to some respect. So, you know, when I'm thinking horror, I guess I kind of am thinking back in, like, the 50s and 60s, but a very off-color horror film for the time. Yeah, I feel like there's a better sense of that in a song later on in the album than than here. True, but we at least admit it's kind of hypnotic. Yes. So yeah, I'm not going to go far back to the 50s because I guess we really don't start getting the really abstract horror films until the 60s, but I'm thinking in that in that vein, in that 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 mood at least. Yeah, I mean I well honestly, I, that part I could see like playing over something like Manus, like in the background of Manus the Hands of Fate or something like in one You know, of those it's funny. Insane. I actually thought the same thing yeah, yeah. just briefly, but Be- I did think because that. it's 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 one of those kind of cheesy kind of what's going on scene this would fit to. Hey, or you know, even, no, regardless no. that that movie gets panned for being for being so the worst movie one ever. One of made. the worst movies of all time, of course. Either way, I still think it had a it had a sufficient eeriness to it. In of fact, course. especially uh, the old film that it was using yeah. that was old for the time, you know, everything about it. So, but what I, I do find myself, and I've done this before on this podcast, I will occasionally reference Mono's The Hands of Fate, the music itself, and it's not a critical thing. Usually it's positive because of what that music 
could have done it for creates the film, an ambience, for a better yeah. film, for instance. I would actually say, and this is something I want to keep bringing up. This is like if Kubrick used a lot more music in his films because he's actually. He doesn't like using a lot in his soundtracks. I would reject that. Major, uh, some of his majorly. best scene work is done without the use of music, specifically for that. I would argue that you're not even thinking about the music that he's using, though. Like, for instance, some of the music he used... This is a, a total diatribe. But, anyway. but either way, what he was doing like in 2001 Space Odyssey was using the work of, of, uh, of Ligeti, who had pieces that... For during parts of it, it's just like a single tone, like yes. a single ambient yeah. tone that you'd think is just like a throwaway, but that's an existing piece of work. Kubrick doesn't do that accidentally. No, no, I'm I'm not talking 2001. I'm talking a lot of his other work. 2001 is a little bit different. If you think of a, uh, what's it called? What's it called? Oh, why am I blanking on his big military film? Oh, I know where you're going. Also, and and. and with full, few ex- full, full metal, metal jacket. jacket. There you go. With exception of some of the most major scene work, he does not use a whole lot of, of, of score work to, to get the emotion across. But I feel like, and it's a compliment, this would fit in with his sort of artistic style. I'm not going to outrule that. But, I I mean, I still album don't want to take... Album-wise, not necessarily song-wise. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um... I, I there's a big thing to note about this track really before we wrap up because otherwise you could just describe it as as building a, an atmosphere of sorts uh but that is the drop the big breakdown I think for this track that occurs much much more toward the end this is where I think the actual noise rock steps in I think up until here we we're bordering on on ambient or uh, a sort of early grungy kind of sound but then Eh, you know, not in like the pop sense, but at least in to- the tone sense. But then here at the end, this is pure noise rock. It's much more frantic. It's really visceral guitar work. Visceral is in like paint splatters again. And it's just D power chords all the way to the end. But yet it was pointed. I think in terms of the context of this track, I loved being unnerved for throughout the beginning of it. And then gradually building up the tension, which just releases in this sort of euphoria here. Yet, Love this first track for that yet, reason. Yet it doesn't actually lose the percussion that had that was part of the. No, track. you're right. That's steady. It, it carried it, straight it, through. It kept its soul the same. Yeah, the, the backbone, That's a major aspect. The backbone of the song was very consistent, and through the end with that euphoric release, it really kind of tied the song together very well. A lot of songs in that scenario would just taper off or fade out, and it actually. It allowed, it gave you an emotional release that you were building the entire song. Yeah, that's true. And also, the thing is, that's a um, that's a problem I think with with noise rock is that you're you're dealing with little little fine lines here and there, where just that simple little decision to, for instance, not break forth into something major like this, kind of would detract from the from the context of the track. If it did just taper off, I would be so much more disappointed with this. Yep. As opposed to being really positive with this so far, I think. I think it served as a phenomenal finale for what is basically an eight-minute tone setter. I mean, for me, this is one of the few tracks that I pretty much like from beginning to end. I have very little complaints about it. Fair if enough. Any. Fair enough. But we do have complaints. I do have complaints on the next track. Just a little boy for Chester, for Chester Burnett. Burnett. This um, one's 12 minutes and 40 seconds. This Gotta song, mention something about the introduction here. Also really an quickly. incredible introduction. Incredible, another incredible yep. introduction. They have a, I, I really like the way they build their setting. Now, as to what they do with the setting later, will vary again as we get into the final yeah. points of this album. But in terms of just, just exposition, I think they're, they're brilliant. They have great ideas here. And I would liken the opening to this track as cosmic background radiation it it feels electronic it feels like a phasing in my ear to a sense and it, it's unnerving but also sort of satisfying because that's why I, I think of cosmic background radiation because it's it's a familiar thing it's everywhere it's, it's it surrounds us it's essentially part of where we are in the universe and yet at the same time it also is a little existential in its own right. Well, it's it's scary yet beautiful. Yeah, that's what it, 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 that's the simplest it way to put it. Makes you feel very mortal. <laughs> exactly. It makes you feel very tiny. This yeah. speck this, of dust on this spinning rock. I.e., mortal. <laughs> yeah, this does the same sort of thing, and actually, it does a great way of, uh, of portraying that cosmic radiation you're going on about with the phasing guitar. The yes. phasing guitar is it mimics it very well. It, it's it's a sine wave, 
that's how they they treat it. Uh, almost a Doppler effect going on. Exactly. Which is number one promotes what you said. It yeah. does a great job of portraying that expansive nature. But number two, it's it's tonally distinct, and for that, I love it because it's something that it really is just recognizable. And you can get right away, and it's it's a very well. That was my feeling. Very pointed sound. The second that I I, I came across it, I was like, this is what I kind of want out of noise rock. I like I think the the versatility of the guitar in that regard. Like if you're gonna do noise rock, then the guitar can't just sit there and and uh, first of all, I don't think it can be so simple as the guitar uh, tone setter that you get in 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 post rock, for instance. Uh, post rock is really just like you, you could drone for hours and hours and, and yes there's a lot of droning going on in this album but what I prefer is is taking it the step further which is to promote the things that, that, that you just said sort of using it to echo something bigger than itself because the guitar is so versatile because you can hook it up to any number of, of pedals and, and amplifiers and phasers and no matter what you can make it mimic bizarre things like cosmic background radiation so why not go for it? Which is why this is a very pleasing moment for me. The second I started doing that, uh, context of this album, it also this this song actually did something that was another unique little tidbit for today's sort of music, and that was create a sort of uh, like chordal mashup, where everything seems to hit a culmination at one point during uh, maybe six refrains, maybe four refrains, maybe just one or two. Where it's almost like the whole tempo and and time signature and time itself in this song just gets changed and you know, gets damaged and gets like stutter stepped and it's almost like you know you, you missed half a second right there. That's just the, I mean it is basically all in six. There's really no no straying from that time signature. It's in six eight almost throughout this. But, so, you know, you picture, picture a, a six eight feel, it's very close to the kind of this waltz, but it's like an inebriated waltz. It stumbles, and, and you can hear those stumbles in those places that you're just describing. The, the, the accents, the percussive accents sort of create this illusion of awkwardness, or trying to restart itself, or add a few extra beats here and there, but then it always finds itself again. If you count it out, it's just six eight. But there's flexibility within that six eight, which is again playing around with existing time signatures, which I love. Well, I felt that that percussion line, especially, kind of gave the song kind of drawl, this kind of almost like a stutter, like you said, that that really did come back around. And a lot of songs when they go for that kind of a stutter, they over accentuate and exaggerate it. But in this, it was just enough for you to know, hey, it sounds like it's kind of getting out of sync, and then it finds itself again, yeah. which added so much character to the song. Yeah, and this is just the first half of the song. This is only about five minutes worth of the song. Yeah, and there's other because, things to because note at here. that at that five minute mark, the song undergoes a, a big tonal change. That, oh, I'm not quite there yet. Oh, you're I not got there a yet. couple, a few other things oh. here to say about this. Even a little bit earlier. Well, yeah, this is still pretty much early in the track here. There's first of all, there's a lot of accents here, and the bass is very strong. And you kind of get on the, on the tonal sense, you're getting a lot of like one one five, one one five. In other words, it's sort of pulls away briefly. You're in a tone, and actually, once it goes to that 5, then you're stepping away. Of course, it's not like a dramatic tonal shift, the 1 to the 5 or anything, but it's, it almost feels like once it goes to 5, it's sort of staying there. It keeps that undertone going, which is almost feels like it's not where it should be, per se. But, it, I don't know, it's just an interesting tonal shift as I noticed it. But it's also a little bit slower, and I felt like the lyrics... I almost want to say, I'm go, I go back and forth in this, but I want to say maybe the lyrics were a little bit distracting at this point. I kind of was over-involved with the tonality of this. I mean, I did, also, in this song, he wasn't doing the same crooner singing that he was doing in the last one. That's right. And I, I said he had different singing styles, and he steps away here. And I, I don't like the kind of yelly, screamy stuff that he does. It's just... I don't know. It seemed. I get I'm not the, sure he wasn't even really screaming at this point, but it it just. I, I felt like his was voice a, was less necessary at this juncture. Well, the vocals is more of a far away, pulled back, echoing kind of a feel to it. Yeah, it was distant. It was kind of chanty in a way, and and I don't know. I just didn't appreciate it as much as the crooner singing from the track before, so I was a little disappointed with the vocals in this track. 
It yeah. also was a little more esoteric than the previous track where he was just using single words. If if, this if was you could become more, more esoteric, yeah, this was a little bit nonsensical. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but that wasn't the worst part of his vocals. Let's step into something else here, because after we've already stepped in, we've already kind of explored the tone here, we have more pitter-patter going on and whatnot, it's, in many ways it's got some similarities to the first but, uh, the first track, but it's a lot darker. Um, then, I, let's explore just one thing of this pitter-patter here. At 3 minutes, 40 seconds, I'm calling this, this, this out specifically, although there's many more instances, but at this particular moment, there's this little guitar strum, which is this beautiful yes. little little yes. little piece of color. Again, that pitter patter that exits it, it, it retreat. I mean, it enters, it retreats. I and pointed exactly at you at that moment. It, it's it's beautiful. It's utterly beautiful. It's probably one of the best tones that would fit the 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 overall uh, the overall setting here. But here's the thing. At that moment, I wanted so much more out of it. Well, that's the problem. So much more. We've talked so many times on this podcast about gimmicky one shot things that come in and then vanish i mean but this is even this is even uh, i w- i would argue this is even a big greater instance of that because yeah. in in those cases i i would cite you know a an instrument that steps in and really didn't like it it fits but why you yeah. know sort of why even put it there to begin with this is something that was it didn't just fit it was probably the most astute thing they could have done at that moment given the backdrop and yet it, it, because it was so astute, it deserved a melody. It deserved expansion. It, it deserved, deserved so more than a more. couple notes. I mean, they didn't. It's not that they didn't do anything with it. There was nothing. Literally nothing. Well, let me describe. It, in my opinion, it's probably one of the biggest teases on about one of our albums to date. It's just two guitar notes. Literally two guitar notes, like tears against the backdrop. I felt like they deserved the chance to sing over the existing, uh, existing backdrop, but. It was astute color, and while I can't accept the pitter-patter of arbitrarily pleasing sounds at this particular moment, I mean, uh, it, it, was just, almost, it needed to expand. Well, it was almost soundbite-esque in the fact that we had this thing, two notes, and then gone. And and there was no development with it. It doesn't come back later. It doesn't come back later in the album. Nothing. It was just a brief... Flash in the pen moment that was gone as quickly as it came. Well, it's gonna is, it's gonna start into one of my greater critiques of the, of this album and and certain things that it starts doing because it it has it has these moments of brilliance, and I I'm gonna liken this album to a work of modern art in this regard that you have paint splatter on a wall, which I argue in certain cases could have been more crafted, and that's kind of a weird shaky road because then you're walking into how people judge modern art to begin with which often begins with the abstract. So you have to accept that. And in, in terms of stirring vibrations, I think this track actually succeeds a lot more than the previous track. But I just think it could have been a little bit more bold with its chosen framework, like in these particular instances. So I detect countless moments like this, like this in which that like, some guitar here or some guitar there or some little random instrument here p- could have expanded on the existing idea. So then... You know, when it doesn't do that, I have to sort of step back and say, maybe it is arbitrary. Maybe it is just random. Well, that's why I, uh, one of the things I wrote for this particular song is that it's full of tidbits of awe. Of just points where you go, where you go, oh, where it truly just does something (laughs) that makes you stop and go, oh, you didn't. That was, (laughs) that was right. Yeah, but and, my, you know I don't like that. I that's why I use the that. word astute. I think that's it. It, you it know. was right. It was that thing that it needed. Astute, yes, astute but is it was, a kind of odd word because it, it implies that there is some kind of grander notion of what is right and wrong that they were somehow able to match up with. But you know, sometimes you got to face the facts. We were all moved at that same moment. Yes, but it was too fleeting for me to latch onto it, and that was the biggest problem for me. The fact that it was so fleeting disappointed me. Yeah. But I would argue one point to that, and that was this song and this album as a whole is trying to put you within a setting. We've already mentioned the word uh, existentialism. It's it's a setting of eerie. You're going to get a lot of eerie and a lot of 
nearly fearful sound. In fact, in this song itself, it's very fearsome. It, it especially around the five minute mark, it go it undergoes a great tonal shift to fear. It it presents moments of beauty surrounded by this eerie. Uh, fearful quality. So relating, pertaining to the name Swans and whatnot. <laughs> I'm well. I mean, not no. even, not even that, not even that. But it's, it's got that extensionism being built into it. It's got that kind that of existentialism. I, yeah, I mean, existentialism. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe what you're arguing here is that it's part of the art in some extent because yes. of the fact that, that you have this, these moments of blue, of beauty. That the purpose is not necessarily to have a fluid beauty. No, but it's to show you beauty in darkness. Granted, granted. Or hope, and, and or so many other things I am things going to show you. go as far to say, you're right, this, this album with this, and this track certainly would not have worked if, it, uh, if some of these moments perhaps weren't as fleeting, because then it can't, it can't tease you. And when it teases you, even though it's not the most, the most orally pleasing thing... But you know to introduce that and then sort of withhold it, it's it's it is still brilliant in its own right because that's sometimes the way life is. That's sometimes what you have to deal with in in uh, the in drudgery the of life, the drudgery of life, and then that moment of perfection. Exactly. Maybe and that's then, why it's a moment of perfection. That's what life is: is that yeah. arbitrary? Uh, some some moments are 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 pleasing by chance. Yeah, I mean, but I would also say that. The fact that it's so fleeting reflects on the fact that perfection is almost a fantasy anyway, and that it would never last because perfection is not a thing that's real or achievable. You're right. This is uh, flipping around to a defense of this of this one moment. Ah, uh, well, I can be the music stickler and say that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I it would per- have, per- it personally would have been, loved it. It could have been uh, a expanded. much different track had they expanded upon it. But I'll leave, I'll leave it, it at this. Be I'm just going to leave it at this. I'll leave it at this. I think, with some expansion, granted not going a balls to the wall, but either way, some expansion could have, and not just this moment, but many others, I'm, I'm trying to treat this uh, track cohesively at this point, but it could have turned it from a curiosity into something more pivotal. I would agree with that. If that, if that, uh... Well, if that, not. that in this track needed to get rid of the laugh tracks that were in it. That's my major gripe. I did not enjoy those. Well, that's coming up a little later here. Because, yeah, we really haven't talked about the end of this track. That was just sort of harping on the beginning. It builds, it builds, it builds. Yes, it's still just color throughout. But then we're, we get into something a little bit more serious here. And that is uh, building up to the final verse here. I'm just a little boy. I'm just a little boy. I'm not human. I'm not human. I need love. And this is wailed. It's completely wailed in the middle of the piece. Granted, we do get the laughter that leads up to it. So there's some there's some maddening qualities to this piece. Certainly... A kind of cacophony that ensues, where Gerard just goes into these spurts of frantic, unintelligible speech, which I'd almost liken to to Tom Waits, uh, but only because of maybe the filter on his vocal track. I, I said it reminded me of the song specifically Tommy the Cat, where yeah. featuring Tom Waits. All right, and then immediately following that, you get sort of the soul of the piece, which is that wailing, that uh, I need love, and he just holds that out. It almost reminded me of like a, a, a Cab Calloway kind of uh, kind of hold. But um, it, it, I want to, I want to like this part. I want to like this part just because of the, of the raw desperation. I do like it because of the raw desperation. That's a great way of putting it. But at the same time, I was still recovering from the broken spell, from the what in my opinion is that oddly placed laugh tracks, which really do a lot to take me out of what was be- what was going on. Well, I, I I tried to justify it by it being part of the sort of the cacophony and the maddening descent into what obviously leads to desperation. But yeah. it but it is very divorced from the track in some way. Yeah, because it wasn't really maddening. It didn't really fit that theme. It wasn't fearful. It was well, yeah. It was laughter, it was and it was actually like genuine laughter. laughter. The kind of, if like someone just like flipped a microphone on for like five seconds at no, a party. No, it's it's the laugh track that sitcoms still use. Eh, I wouldn't go that far. Actually, I think a lot of it is like Jara over Jara, <laughs> or maybe various other members of the band. I don't know, but um, yeah, I guess we were in agreement that it kind of didn't fit per se. It's 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 an artsy fartsy tool, in my opinion. I don't think it really it's it's I don't think it's so pivotal to the. It's in many ways I'm, I'm likening exactly to to what we just described. It 
Granted, it's vocals, but it's the same as that guitar. It steps in and it's gone. It's not like it's an intertwined uh, feature of this track. No, but it comes back a few times. It's not just the one time. Yeah, right, it does yeah. actually come back. It does have multiple But each, each time it serves the purpose of sort of taking you away from the greater song. Well, Which is uh, what I didn't want. That's the whole thing. <laughs> so we're being selfish at this point, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I really can't justify it on the, on the artsy level either. I think... Um, well, only because... Because I think the, the goal of this track is fairly simple. It's not that it's trying to, I think, be, uh, you know, have a subversive melody or any... I mean, sorry, a, a goal or anything, or message. But, you know, it, let me just read the earlier lyrics here. Now I sleep in the belly of woman, and I sleep in the belly of man, and I sleep in the belly of rhythm, and I sleep in the belly of love. I sleep in the belly of oceans, I sleep in the belly of truth, I sleep in the belly of kindness, and I sleep in the belly of you. I'm just a little boy, I'm just a little boy, I'm not human, I'm not human, I need love. That, that's a straightforward set of lyrics, as far as I'm concerned. I feel like, in many ways, that, that doesn't really require an, an abstract approach in the musical department. Um, it made it kind of odd. Yeah, and it gives it that kind of disjointed, unnerving feel just on the lyrics alone. And the, I agree, I think the laugh track takes away from those moments and it would have been better to just have him singing these things frantically like he was yeah or and another thing I, I also different, laugh, different laughter yeah <laughs> you know well, that's it's just what I said tone. before it's sometimes when it comes to noise rock even just minor little shifts because because you're basically talking about something that is as shaky as as modern art it will take just little things like that. Oh, different laughter here. Or a different placement of that particular uh, white noise. Or that brand of white noise. Maybe do that a little bit lower in a lo-fi tone as opposed to a, a abrasive tone or something. It, it's just all about the way it fits together in context. So, yeah, I'm forced to take a step back and say, maybe there's some random choices in here and it wasn't entirely thought through. That said, there are some things I like. For instance, just right here in the outro... We get a little bit of a instrumental, and I only say instrumental because it's the first time he stops outwardly singing. And it's the first time an instrumental kind of goes somewhere. And this is an interesting thing, just based on what I just said, because it, it too, is an example of something that isn't drastically different from the thing that I just said I hated. But, in a way, it works within its little framework. It's this sort of, what I call a staggered breakdown where these power chords step in. This is right here at the end. They step in in these brief spurts, and then it comes in strong, and then it departs. And it comes back. And those intervals get really, really closer and closer as it progresses. So within that, it's actually, I felt, a lot more powerful than uh, the majority of that, um, of that white noise chorus. It was a great outro for that reason. Yeah, and this is actually something they, they use pretty o- uh, often, in this album, they they like to change things. It's the staggering. <laughs> That's a light way of putting it. It's their staggering of pieces like this, which is what makes parts of it very intriguing, because the staggering of introducing introducing that that heavier level of of uh, noise rock, and not making it predictable, is what makes things interesting. Right, even if it is slow and involved, which I can still accept as long as it's interesting. Yeah. You know, that's that's really the kind of the fine line that you walk here. Um, so yeah, I'm down with the outro, but so far we have a very mixed track on our hands as we head into track three. A Little God in My Heads. This oh, head. <laughs> yes. I guess you don't have heads. Hands. hands. Is it really hands? hands? Yes. A Little, a little God, God in, in My hands. hands. As if to be holding a God in your hand. A little dyslexic moment. I bet. Um, the track is seven minutes and eight seconds. The shortest track on the album so far. And one of my favorite. This track, for all the creep we've already gotten, was fun. The intro. the intro here, especially considering I described the last two tracks as this very haunting intro. Here, this is so much more goofier than I expected. I, I would ja- call it still jarring. It's a not happy. It's a jaunty stride in four four. Yeah, and it was once again uh, using stuttering techniques to really set everything up. Yes, it was. Yeah, jaunty does does a good job of describing it, but it's still not. It's still somewhat unsettling. It's. 
it still has a bit of a haunting sound. Um, this was also a track that the vocals really stood out for me. Not just how he was singing, but in fact, here lyrics are, are going to start playing a major role in what's going on. Here. Interesting thing. Once the vocalist stepped in, I detected a lot, a lot of resemblance here to uh, Light Clockwork, the album by, that we reviewed in episode 52 by Queens of the Stone Age, which also kind of seemed to be going for this haunting vibe. Hell, all you have to do is just look at the cover of that album. It's got like this sort of depiction of Dracula and whatnot. And I remember in, in that particular album, the very opening track, uh, especially the effects on the vocals, you know, had this sort of haunting quality to it. And I remember feeling that right here with this vocalist. It's like almost the same exact tone to me. Even though, of course, that's stepping away from the goofy intro, but it does really step away from the goofy intro pretty quickly. Um, I mean, I I don't know that I'm positive whether that, that uh, vocal style pleases me necessarily. It wasn't my favorite part of this track, to be honest. And at this particular point, I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant, actually, with the whole cocky stride, I think, in this music, because... It, it seems almost like a front, I suppose, for a lack of substance, but then, after yet another white noise build, which we're no stranger to at this point, more along the lines this time of a sort of an electrical disturbance, uh, as opposed to the um, to what I described in the previous track as as, um, as background radiation, this time this it's more, more like a radio tuning band. This is more uh, of a calamity instead of just... An overpowering of the last track, or like a search throughout, like the 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 electromagnetic spectrum, that kind of thing. But either case, that was that was all giant M dash, because I was very much proved wrong by assuming that there was a lack of substance in this. Because there, the most exhilarating moment I think on the album yet at this point was immediately following that white noise build. It seamlessly gives way to these harmonic guitar chimes. Oh, and John, you were loving that. that I moment. it was well, it 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 did a lot to cement this as one of my favorite tracks. Well, also one of the more beautiful transitions we've heard thus far. It, it was the, a lot the, of the, the transitions it. jumped from place to place. This seamlessly moved from one place to another. And it really because it, it was this great tension, then it was just released. And you know, it, the, even though I'm pretty sure it is guitar, guitar harmonics, it uses. It's in sort of a chime-like fashion that it almost sounds a little bit like a vibraphone had just stepped into the mix. And it really fulfilled, again, the versatility of the guitar that I really pine for in music like this. And this was a clear-cut B section. This was sort of a reinvention of what melody was there, mm -hmm. um, but still fit within the, the song itself. It did not feel divorced. It felt extremely different. I, I would say that it went from... It's jaunty, like, eerie to really jaunty, but kind of black in but, nature. But no, I think that, and I think nature. that's just what gave me a little bit more substance here because I was originally seeing the jauntiness as a kind of cocky stride, as I said. This was and like then the dangerous. second this stepped in, this was truly dangerous. Yeah, there and, was like there was a legitimate reason to be. Uh, well, because it evolved, <laughs> it, it evolved from what was already there and gave us that more substance that you were looking yeah. for. This, We're talking in very became, general terms here, but I It I became think kind of like describe. madness. Do you know, that's not how I described the guitar chimes at that point. I would, that was a very no, pleasing it release. No, it evolved into... What this this section second section did, it became... Ah, uh, we're talking later on here. Yeah, it became maddening. It became... almost insanity. Well... And it, it fit along with uh, a lot of what he was singing. Forever holy, forever hungry... Forever hateful, forever beautiful, forever needing, forever reaching, forever stinking, forever breathing, forever growing, forever leaving. You know, beautiful dichotomy being built there. Yeah. I'm kind of scary. I, I gotta say, I'm a little... harsh at times. It is harsh. Especially considering the music here, which I still, you know, I really can't go, I can't go that dark with it, because it is still kind of perpetuating the same rhythmic stride from earlier. Um, in a sense, it sort of combined constancy and alteration, which I think really justified the intro for me, and I think bolstered its importance in context. We do sit in this groove for a while, but then when it does get a little more intricate is actually when the when the chant steps in here and that's a different part of those lyrics which I was really looking at 
um, these lyrics, summon my soul so part, summon my soul so part. It goes on and on like that in in a very distorted. Oh, it's distorted, but at the same time, it's kind of fun. I kind of was, fun no, in, in, no, in, the, was, in the meter that they're singing that. Yeah, but it was it was kind of monstrous in his presentation. Well, that was the idea. It was almost supposed to wash over it's you. like lurking in the background. Yeah. yeah. And I really like these tribal choruses. It's actually one of the other highlights of the song for me because they were just... The rhythm that they were singing in was very, again, kind of hypnotic, which they've done already before. Kind yeah. of this, this role of this repeating lyric that really kind of allows you to zone out and and at the same time kind of focus on that specific thing from the background. On top of that, that's also the point where uh, uh, Michael Jarrah's melody uh, really starts expanding. So it, uh, suddenly here, once you have that background vocal track, his melody really starts turning into a melody. It's actually, you know, it's, it's not just a repetitive motif at this point. It's it's an honest-to-God melody, and I, I, was, I was actually kind of invested in this. You have two, kind of two things to pay attention to at this point, where I think for the majority of this album, you really are just in a zone. So I think that's really, I think, what uh, what solidified this track for me. Well, this ending you, was you, definitely... You forget the time. Right. You forget the time stamp. Oh, yeah. This this, this didn't feel like seven minutes, and and this song really engaged you, especially towards the end. The end is, I felt, the most engaging part. Yeah. And that's actually one of the most positive aspects of these first three tracks. They don't feel their time. They They don't feel, you know, ten minutes long. They do have that length. Some. Some though there are parts where it may begin to wear on you, but personally, I I kind of just went through them. I stayed in the groove, except for those little laughter tracks we were talking about. That kind of dropped me out. But otherwise, I stayed where they put me. No, yeah, and, I agree. And I, I just especially in it, at least in this track, a little uh, a little god in my hands. This is this is definitely one of those tracks which I'm going to defend. That context ties it together, no matter what its length. Yeah. Um I would agree. As I said, I could sit in this groove pretty much forever. Uh, and the melody, once it begins, it's something you can really sink your teeth into. And then it does transition back into white noise. So again, you have a, a kind of a lot of symmetry, I think, in this track. Because you, you build up the white noise at which had just you know, lended you this, this previous several minutes of, of, of groove. And then we're all over the tuning band here. I mean, at this point, it, it even it's even more powerful than it was the first time we got it prior to this uh, this mix. And then finally, it's just the, the end of the track is just a transition into these sort of steady, solitary guitar strums, like like echoes of what we just emerged from. It again, poignant doesn't even do it justice. This is the kind of symmetry that I look for in a track like this. I mean, it, I love to be able to at least kind of bracket the sense of seven minutes, and it succeeds in that. I agree, absolutely, completely, <laughs> completely, absolutely, yes. indubitably. <laughs> Well, Indeed. All right, so we find a track where we're gonna, that we agree on. So now let's move into a track that I think is going to... Um, no, we agree on this track. We agree on this track. And I know why Storm was feeling kind of Debbie Downer here, because I, I think uh, we're, we're in universal agreement on Bring the Sun. So Bring the Sun slash... Toussaint Louverture. Thank you. Is 34 minutes and 5 seconds long. So, you know, get a Coke or something. The thing about this song is, as long as it is, there is less to talk about here. For such a length of time... All I can say is, I, I really hope that as a listener, you were able to make it through the album with which to hear us at this point. <laughs> Chat about it, yes. This song, I mean, I, I Brass Tax, I freaking hated it. I just hated this song. And there are a lot of reasons oh. why... But the biggest reason was there are so many moments where I would be aware of where I was in the song and then I would look at the timestamp and go, oh, it's only been two minutes. Oh, it's only been three minutes. Oh, it's only been five minutes. Oh, it's only been 17 and then 18 and then 20. Okay, I'll adjust this. And then you 25. And Matt, John, you both are in, in unilateral agreement on this track. I still think it has plenty to offer, especially in the first half here, Bring the Sun. And even but, Toussaint Louverture can be provocative at times. But... If you, if you can... But... If you have the patience. You can get what it has to offer by paring down this song into about a four-minute track. There's no reason for it to be 34 yeah, minutes. Yeah. And also, the tail end of the track, and I know we want to try to go sequentially, but I feel like with this track, we're going to jump around a little since there wasn't a ton I'm of substance. I'm going sequentially. <laughs> but no. Screw you. <laughs> well, all I want to say is that the yelling that 
encompasses a good tail track, a part of the track. I mean, it was just maddening to me. I couldn't stand it. Right. His vocals in this track drove me bonkers. For me, it's a mix. It's a very healthy mix. And I'm gonna, I'm, I, if I, if you allow me to have my rant here, I will walk you through this track and see if you comment whenever you feel, um, you you feel it's needed. But let's just go through the, the motions here. We begin with another interesting in, uh, introduction, although it's, it's, it's brief. It's sort of a, a faint quiver that you get in the beginning, that almost immediately after it begins, it dives into this sort of 3-1 thrash. And what I mean by 3-1 is that's where the accents lie. It's a waltz, so it's got like 1-2-3, one, 1-2-3, two, three, one, two, three, but then the accents are on the 3-1, so 1-2-3-1, one, 3-1, three, one, three, one, three, one. and that's what you hear over and over and over and over again. Which, in my opinion, was a very was a much less graceful transition there than in any previous moment here. Going from the light quiver into that, that was that was kind of unnerving at that it point. It was sudden, and jerky, goes, and unnerving. Yeah. Exactly, and then it just goes on and on and on. I wasn't really gauging anything from it. Now, the dissonances do step in here and there. They're creepy at times, but in terms of repetition, this one was very nauseating. I couldn't help but notice the time stra- stamp on this track. It's true. Two minutes in, still no change worthy of note. Two minutes and 30 seconds, we breathe. Very much a sigh of relief as we just kind of explore some of the other tones around here. At this point, seems kind of ambient. The guitars seem to be playing around with feedback and, and kind of the gain a little bit. So you get these little sporadic swells, which is something I, I, I even missed from earlier on. You get lots of volume swells and lots of upward bends here and there. It's another thing that kind of helps provide tension. So, especially considering we're past the thrashing moment, I was pretty satisfied with this section, because it's probably the lightest moment on the album yet. You don't get a lot of pure ambient within this noise rock. So I think it was a nice moment. Um... This is also when Jira starts singing, in which I was immediately brought back to Silver Mount Zion Memorial Orchestra, because it's almost the same exact singing style, same filter. It's a kind of non-singing, actually, where he's not really, he's not really reaching the note. It, it's, it's more like a struggle for survival itself, or like the pain has consumed him beyond repair, that level of existentialism. It does slow down, though. We get a little 6-8 a little bit later on. It has a very different quality to it. But this is a different kind of 6-8. It's like a dark pit of despair 6-8. The drums are using mallets here to sort of bring out the, the delicate thud, which I absolutely love. But again, this is the part I'm really defending. It's cyclical and kind of entrancing in the way you hear the mallets just on the, uh, on, on, on the snare it very well could be. Um, but it's in a very gradual way here. We're at the 8-minute mark at this point. We start building... And we start overlapping guitars. There's some interesting wide interval guitar comping going on here. More like competition, though. Not so much comping. They're kind of competing against each other. And this is where you start to get the uh, the um, the noise from the noise rock. I, I think this is the part you started to be deterred by. Am I correct? Yes. I believe it went a little something like this. And stuff like that. It was, it was, and then, and then, and then, blah. Fair enough. It was a cacophony of annoying. So oh, the geez. thing is, in in previous tracks, there had been smaller walls of noise, but they were accented by things. They had layers and depth. This was just a solid brick wall of loud, and there was no texture to it. There was nothing defining to it. It didn't go anywhere. It just made noise. This is about, I think, between 18, 8 and 14 minutes on this track, to be real specific. I defend a little bit of the earlier half of that, but yes, it starts getting very unintelligible. Like, I defend the parts where the drums are a little bit more March-like and get this cool volume swelling again. Um, and also what I'm noticing are these little subtle transitions, even within this, like subtle layering ever since the opening thrashes begin, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't really similar to the beginning. I... I I don't know. The raw intensity is nice. It was overwhelming. But o- over raw, shall we say? It was know. just. It was. It was a wall of sound. There was no give to it, and it went on for way too long. What do you mean a- by that? No give. I'm curious by the, your choice of words. Uh, there. there was no fluctuations. It. Fu- I still argue there are fluctuations, but it's in again, as I said, subtle. Subtle. Yeah, transition. mostly because subtle we had a pull down. But no. that's what. Let me explain. He asked me. Oh, okay. <laughs> The, they don't know. <laughs> the wall of sound, and what I mean by no fluctuation or give, is this fact that it was nuanced, and the the loud was so loud and in your face, you had to concentrate to find it. And I was so busy being 
blown away in a bad way by how loud and jarring it was, I couldn't look for intricacies. I didn't care. I wanted it to stop. And it went on for four minutes. Five minutes. Whatever it was. Six, actually. Six. (laughs) This is my point. And that's just too long to keep someone drowning in the sound for. I want to defend it on the on the grounds of artistic integrity because essentially this is this is their point to really thrash. I don't think they really go to this extent at any other point on the album. Yay. So in a sense, yeah, granted, of course, but you're you're ignoring the climax to some degree, and I'm no, I'm no, merely playing no. devil's advocate because I do not enjoy Argument, this myself either. I had to lower the volume. I never do that. I had to lower the volume on a track I was listening to in my headphones. If I cannot... Maybe because you were listening to the shitty Spotify OGG compressive format. Yeah, but I got damn good headphones. All right? <laughs> no, that's not going to save from OGG. But but it's... it's. If I seriously... I'm, at this point, I'm forcing myself to listen to this track. Yeah, at this point, and to the here's end. the pro- here's the oh, worst right. part. I just here's the I'd worst some part. It's only half over, and I could have watched a sitcom in this time without commercials. <laughs> All right. Yes, the, the there is no way a track could redeem itself from this point. No way. I don't care what follows. You mean within this track itself? Within this track, there's no way it can redeem itself. Right. We're not saying the album yet, because the album certainly does redeem itself in places here. No, not at a 15-minute mark of a 30-minute track. Not after five minutes of just... Not even noise. But then again, this is technically two songs. So I'm going to move this a little bit further here. Um... I, I do like one thing, though. I, I, I'm going to argue just at least on one part, and this is only just one little thing about this, uh, about this, um, this thrash here. But I, I'm more interested, I think, in the little understated things during this. Like, during the build, which, again, is pretty much just D over and over and over and over again. You do have these low tones, which step in and out, uh, like E-flats, played with the D above it. That's a major, major seven, so that's the widest interval you can have within an octave, which forms a curious dissonance. Then the general thrash going on in the midst. Uh, it, it's that interval, I think, at that staggered pace that I now almost exclusively associate with Boards of Canada, believe it or not, um, because they love that interval, especially in what they did back in uh, Tomorrow's Harvest. But I would consider it scintillatingly uncomfortable, which in part well, I was able to defend this section for that reason. That's but me. It, I'm going back to what I said about just a little boy. These are it's it's full of tidbits of awe. All right, I'm going to support you here. I'm yeah. going to support you here at this point because getting back to the thrash. Yes, we're hammering away now at 14 minutes and change, and we're looking for another breather. By now, I'm definitely looking for something else. I'm looking for something to wow me in in like the point that follows. You know, we've had very many. Uh, points in this album now where it builds, it builds, it builds. We have a, this 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 cacophony of white noise and whatnot, and then it releases. It releases into something. It's it's almost always this very satisfying moment after all that because of you as as you have frequently pointed out, Matt. Almost anything would be a release after that. Yes. But here I'm I'm looking for outright justification. I need something. I need something phenomenal. Um. I'm kind of lacking substance at this stage. So yeah, let's let's move on to what we move into because technically this is the separate track here. This is really Toussaint Louverture because it's considered a separate thing. So here in this breather, we're kind of breathing, but I would probably argue that we're more heaving because you have this drawn out, heavily distorted tone, but it's still, you don't have the thrash. It's sort of a lo-fi anger, and honest, I don't know, it's something that kind of moves me a little bit, almost like the testosterone or the anger that you might feel pent up in a garage or something like that, but not in a constrained formulaic format. It's, it's mature for a teenager's feel, I felt, despite that Michael Gerard is like 60 now, which is neither here nor there. But apart from that, it's, I don't know, it, it's, it's subtle, but, I don't know, I'm not quite defending it. I'm kind of defending what it goes into. You get a little bit of a mesh of old strings being strummed here, in no particular order. Like someone just got into the piano and just started mucking shit up. It's a similar sound by, actually, 
that I think I would use for for films that often uh, feature the descent into madness, where you hear that like tick 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 tick, you know, everything's a little bit high pitched and, and creepy, that kind of thing. You hear it a lot in film. Close, but not exactly. They have their own spin on it. And then it moves into Sue. I think was the real soul of this. <laughs> The sort of story here that, in some sense, follows uh, what you, uh, Toussaint L'Ouverture, who was the leader of the Haitian Revolution, and you get some sort of tale here, I think, of that itself. So now you're talking flat-out off-Broadway, like, abstract art at this point. You're dealing with sound bites that are, like, hammering and, and scraping carpentry things being built you all recall this right yeah. yes okay i guess you weren't having it no no all right no it was soundbite at best it was just here's the thing it had no bearing on the rest of the song no. it, had no, it had more knock knock hook, hook, it, it was odd hook. but it had more bearing to me i think than many than a few other tracks in this album in which i was just kind of left with the groove and the groove alone i think yes, this was more well, I, a... I kind of was at least curious by the performance art that's the word I was looking for. I was and that, so, okay, no, no, no. There's your argument right there. This is this is this is going to become an an art argument. Probably. I don't see I don't see the redeeming qualities of that. Not in this context. I was so frustrated with the song at this point, where it had gone, and then what it was building to, that these little sound bites were nothing but a distraction and an annoyance to me. I didn't care point, about the context. Let's Let me cite finish. some other things. No, no. At the that horses point, horses neighing just to give audience an at idea. At that point, they stopped making music. Uh, like I can't a point blank. I'm gonna. I'd, I'd argue that at that point they stopped making music. I can't say that. I would so disagree far. with that too. As much as I hate this no, track, because that's not it true. was just they this were literally music, throwing in sound bites. Yeah, but the sound bites were over music. It was no different than a soundtrack to a movie at that point. The fact that they're using there's still a mel- uh, some kind of tone back there with these sound bites over it. It wasn't non music. If anything, I'm gonna I'm gonna cite something else here. When they start breaking in with the horses neighing, the instruments actually start echoing the neighing to some extent. It's like the the neighing leads directly into the instruments in a very sickening way, actually, because when the guitar replaces it, it feels very off, like something's not quite right. So I agree, yes, this is not necessarily pleasing to the ear, but it's interesting. It's an interesting concept, just like what we were saying before about how the guitars are mimicking the background cosmic radiation. You know, that's an interesting notion, but maybe there's other people that wouldn't quite get that like we got that. Well, but, here's one for you. But y- <laughs> you said quote, not pleasing to the ear. I don't think all music has to be has to be, um... But you can't I can't see that as a, a argument. It's interesting, but we you have don't often, like listening to it. We have often it. cited instances of things that are disturbing, but they're disturbing, disturbing because we like it. No, disturbing We like that they're thing. disturbing. We I like, like that they're uncomfortable. We no, said I agree. that, Flat. I agree. But this is point blank not enjoyable to the ear. Not because it's disturbing or something like that. No, it's just purely grating and hurts my ears. Well, I can't argue with that. Obviously, if you, you hear what you hear, I'm simply leaving room open that this is not uh, this is not a hurtful thing in terms of my rating, which we'll get to at the end. You're you're defending this one quite harder than I thought. It's only because he hates something else more than it. I hate I late, I, I, I'm flat out saying it. What we get later in this album, and I will say it when it comes to it, is we get, we get pointlessness without the art to back it, without the concept of something here. It's, you know, I, I'm not saying I necessarily understand all of what's going on here, but it's pretty interesting when he starts stepping in with the, uh, with the, uh, the common tropes of the French Revolution, you know, uh, liberty, egality, fraternity. It's, it's interesting how it's sort of stated in an ironic fashion, like there is some kind of uh, menace lurking in the background, which obviously we know from history was absolutely the case. So, and, yeah, it's a kind of a historical art in some sense. And I get your defense, and I understand your standpoint, but at this point, in a 30-minute track, hitting the 20 to 25-minute mark, I'm so frustrated, bored, annoyed, aggravated, that I don't All those things? care. <laughs> it's not a matter of... That not being artistic. Because I can't argue that. Art is perspective sometimes. But I just didn't care anymore. I was done with this track. I'd had enough. It dragged on. I still listened. But at this point, I was forcing myself to listen to try and find things. And I was just so frustrated with it. (laughs) I didn't care if it had artistic. All right, then let me walk out the end of this track here. 
because I, I do agree with you in certain moments here. Like, for instance, I, I have quite a few instances of flightiness. I mean, just to exhibit that, further on, I gotta stay. I, the thrashing begins again. The second it, it takes itself out of the, the sort of frightened animal uh, feel, then it's just, you know, cue more thrashing. The, at that point, the animal sound is indetectable and, and it, kind of pointless at that point, so I'm kind of looking to return to the, the French Revolution artistic side. Um, then you get a, bre- a breather again, so it's constant like thrash, breathe, thrash, breathe. You get whistling, you get wailing, name a sound, it is probably making a cameo at the end here. But then, to exhibit the flightiness even further, I gotta say, I'm starting to enjoy the little backdrops again. The bass, when it's turned up, can really dominate. The vibraphone-esque synth quivering is a really great compliment. Even him yelling out, Toussaint Liberty, it's provocative, in a sense, to me. But then I reel back to the note that relative randomosity of what's going on, it's not so much a matter of hit or miss, it's a matter that they can hit or simply be there. And that's where I'm very negative on this track, is the moments where they're just there, where the art is not as cohesive as as, um, as it very well could be, or it is in certain moments. So just, just to kind of put a period at the end of the sentence here. I want to take away some meaning at the stage from the lyrical content and from the other things here, but I do have to step back and acknowledge that it's very indeterminate at some points, and also, you know, the fact that it's kind of clouded in this. The the, the lyrics, you know, it suddenly steps into Spanish. Sangre de Dios, hijo de Dios, amor de Dios, sangre es vida, vida es sangre. Basically, this is, this is blood of God, son of God, love of God, blood is life, life is blood, blood is life. Um, I might have repeated that. Love is blood, and then Finally, Toussaint, Toussaint's kind of echoing the refrains of the Haitian Revolution again. It's interesting, but then I have to one. I mean, it's not that this is difficult Spanish. This is Spanish for for you know the year one, year two, and whatnot. But it, I do have, I do struggle with art forms that attempt to cloud their point to a certain extent. I don't think there's too much to this, but that's where I am with this track. It's more of a split down the middle, whereas I think you're kind of hating on it in a very outright way. Um, and that's really all I have to say about it. So let's move on to something that we might agree on. Sure. Oh, as the final track of CD1, the song Some Things We Do. Uh, I I want to say almost unanimously. I don't know if Storm loved it as much as Steve and I. I. I believe it's the best track on the entire album. I'm with that. Yeah. Um, I, I like... <laughs> I liked it. I didn't enjoy it. The difference is, is that... Well, see, the thing for me is... I really look exasperated, man. They can't see it. You used to get mad at me all the time for pointing out physical things. Do it anyway. I'm telling you guys. Just do it. I like doing it, man. You can't stop them. What I like about the track is that the overall aesthetic, pretty much of the whole track from beginning to end, is this kind of zombie-esque drone to it. That was actually really interesting to me. There's a drone. I actually, and, you know, the interesting about the the introduction here is that it actually had kind of a bossa nova tonality, uh, if not necessarily in the rhythm, at least in the tonality. Um, but you know, it doesn't really last. It moves into something else. First of all, singing style, uh, much more under the magnifying glass at this point. It's kind of back to where we were in the beginning. Uh, that sort of really close, kind of creepy, right up against the mic. That that's the kind of stuff that I think is really more moving uh, to my tastes. Um, and probably the most moving style of singing that, he, singing that he has, at least at this point. Also, a note about cello. We have a cello. That, that's my note. It exists. The fact that it exists is just awesome. It's a new instrument, and I have already stated that the cello is... Well, I, I'm very rare on points in which I don't like the cello, to be honest. The fact that the instrument exists in any track is often a plus... But it, it has specific purposes here. And the funny thing is it's not really used to provide a, 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 a majestic melody or even like a, even like a creepy undertone, as it were. It's, it's, it's actually used to create this overlapping tension and chaos that builds beneath the vocals throughout the entire track. This... And very gradually. So you will hear it distinct in the beginning, but then later on it becomes more clear. I this, mean, that's more interesting, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because you were actually doing one of me's. Yeah. <laughs> um, this track, I liken the the overall work to a spider web. And, and hear me out, because this is one of my bigger metaphors of the night. Um, I'm ready. It's, the between the vocals and the main theme work, 
uh, it's it's a very woven yet lightly woven combination of the two. Uh, they don't really touch upon anything too heavily because the actual main theme work is is very eth- uh, ethereal. 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 Words are hard. You pulled, you, you pulled a you with that I point. did pull a me. <laughs> um, it's very ethereal. It's very light touches on everything. Yet you get that accenting strumming through the percussions and the cello that are those vibrations. Those those plucking of the web itself. Yeah. And it, I think this it also metaphorically leads into what I saw as the actual theme of the song. Which... I know we have two different ways of putting it, but they kind of mean the same thing. I saw it as the wretched explanation of humanity. Oh, that's that, and it's that, and so much more. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to stick with music just for one minute here, because I, I got one more thing about the cello here, because it seems to be a driving factor here. There's other instruments going on, but it all serves to build that that undertone of chaos. Um, the cello is an instrument, I think it's very powerful in, in its acoustic purity. It has its own unique versatility, and the swells and the swells and the slides that exist here, the little glissandos along the strings here, were so much more unnerving than what you'd expect from a cello that I absolutely loved it. That... Not all at once, but especially like at 3.30, for instance, 3 minutes and 30 seconds, I'm sufficiently creeped out. And that's what I'm saying. It shows the vulnerability of the rest of the song itself. Oh, that's true, and there's so much vulnerability here, and we're going to get right into that now. The lyrics, it, it's simply a, a, re- a reiteration of, I think, all the basic fundamental human things that we do, for instance, as the title puts forth. Flat out, we fuck, we love, we forget, we regret. Love that, just in, in its simplicity there. Well, but furthermore, we work we search, we share, we move, we keep, we blind, we take, we hide, we hold, we breathe, we still. Every, this is a painful reduction of humanity, so much so that it's drop-dead brilliant. Horribly existential, but brilliant. Because as the instrumental tension rises, simply carrying along with this list of inane verbs comes across as cyclical and pointless, almost as if the music represe- itself represents the encroachment of death, while we just blissfully, or not so blissfully, continue. That's why I said in the beginning that it had a very zombie-esque tone, because the way these lyrics are stated is, zombies move from place to place with little thought, just doing, 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 doing. And that's what these lyrics convey. Very much no thought, just doing. We fuck, we fight, we this, we that. I can't, just I can't, doing. I can't do that. I can't, I can't say to that extent, because yes, yes, we fight, but... We heal, we pray, I'm we just, hate, we love. There's all, everything. but I'm not saying that it's talking about them being zombies. I'm saying the way it's sung is zombie-esque, very droned and very thoughtless, just very going through the motions, doing, doing, doing. No, and that is without true. Thinking that is true. It and is, also, I did forget to mention another fact. It's a name in a way. It is. It is a name. Um, I do actually really like this track. It is one of my favorite tracks, and one of the biggest reasons is because it's only five minutes and nine seconds. And it follows that atrocity <laughs> that we listened to before. Oh, fair. And that boosted its enjoyment for me just because it was the length of a moderately normal size track. Interesting thing about this track, it actually features Annie Clark. Well, actually, I think Annie Clark has been featured earlier on. Believe it or not, I think she was in the earlier part of that montro- monstrosity, Bring the Sun. Um, but just in very background vocals. And, of course, we reviewed Annie Clark's, uh, well, her stage name is St. Vincent in episode 86. Um, just a fun fact. Not that her, her role in this is, is, I think, really really strong, but it's a fun little fact. Uh, but apart from that, yes, let's go back to the theme here, because I think this is this is clearly the most pivotal moment in the entire album here, because it starts to bring the theme to life, the the very wretched, as you said, wretched humanity. Because it is wretched when you, when you state it in such a zombie way. That's what you pointed, Matt. It's all about the delivery here yeah. that makes it seem so. I mean... When you look at the things, when you look at these actual things, you don't think of them as being, as being uh, wretched because they're things that we deal with every day. We see, we feel, we need, we fight, we seal, we grow. There's so much here. It's it's almost every facet of humanity. Everything it's... everything that makes us humanity, uh, and to come to think of it, anything that makes us organic uh, to begin with. Because there's animalistic things here, too. And that's why I like the way it's sung, because the way it's sung is anything but human. It feels very without humanity, very bland, very 
very stripped, very zombie esque. Yeah. I, I I took it a little bit differently. It felt more purposeful than that. It felt muted, but procl- it felt like a proclamation. I a muted pro- proclamation, but it it was more. That's not the way the music supports. No, it. it's not just we. It's not zombies going. We see. We feel. They're still owning it. Again, you're missing oh, the point. Course, I'm saying the style of singing sounds zombie-esque. They are still humans doing these things. But also, when it gets to the last part where he just keeps going, we love, we love, we love. It's and speed, deadening. It's, it's deadening. deadening. He speeds it up a little. It very much feels like a snap. Like, that's it. I'm done. I can't even say anything else. I'm with I just Matt on this point. Stuck in this loop. Go figure. Mindlessly. On, I'm definitely with Matt on this point. Go figure because on it, I. This is why I go back to this this one uh, way in which I put it: a, a painful reduction of humanity. It's reducing all the things which we otherwise, as humans, really like to promote and, and feel insanely special about. And this track sort of puts you in the bigger picture, which is what existentialism is all about. In the span of the universe, in the span of everything else, this becomes. It becomes asinine almost that we just engaged <laughs> in all of these little things. It's 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 cyclical. We go over and over and over and over again. This is the entirety of our lives for eighty years. We just do these things and we die. That's it. That's the uh, you can't get more existential than that. And it, you know, as as I said, it was horribly existential because it is a very depressing thought to very to, heavy, to heavy realize message too. Yeah, because obviously we we kind of like enjoying these things and we're we're effectively we're deluded by these things it's really the only way we can function as human beings if is if we we let ourselves be deluded by these things and involved in these things but as far as as far as the track is concerned it really cuts to the throat that's the heart of the matter that's what happens then we die and the music in the background supports that intensely it's a chaos that brings to life the 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 painful redundancy of of these facets of life but it still prevents it in a very beautiful way well it's got that it's that tiny yeah. dash of hope just the you know that maybe in, that there, dash there is of hope me- that maybe there that, is meaning the dash of hope could very well be the cello the fact that the cello is even there i think is a very interesting notion because i think we associate the cello as a very human instrument the way it sings almost in the same register as as 80 percent of humans but it, it does allude to that there is some meaning behind all these meaningless activities. See, but it's not saying that the activities are meaningless. It's being delivered in a meaningless way, which is different. Yeah. And also, this song, the thing it's I think... It's more like a when you stand back and look at it kind of thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, and also the thing I think I like most about this song is while a lot, of, a lot of other songs I fault for lacking emotion, this is empty, but not for... It's a void of emotion, which is different. It leaves you with this kind of emptiness, especially... That, to me, makes it the most powerful emotion. Well, that's what because I'm saying. Emptiness it's, and it's, existentialist, uh, uh, how would you put it, um, uh, rumination, I think. Rumination is, 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 the, is a very powerful emotion in and of itself. The, co- the concept of, of I mean, mulling things over time and time again, that's part of the human condition. We ponder. And that's why I think it's one of the most... It is the most powerfully emotional track on this record. Because that final line, when he's just saying we love over and over again, almost dead, with no music, it just... It kills and crushes you because he's not saying it lovingly. So it's it's Or hate-filled. Right. Or lust-filled. It's just emptiness. And that's brought out of uh, of that uh, particular phrase. um, We... What was it again? We, We love... We... We fuck, we, we There's a we lot forget. of different combinations. We love, we, no, we fuck, we love, we forget, we regret. And I think the order of the, those are very important. Yeah. The fact that you, you fall in, in, into, into love. Actually, I think love was second, interestingly. Yes. We fuck, we love. We fuck first. In other words, the animalistic urge takes place, and then we give way to love as some kind of human superimposition over what your body was telling you to do in the first place. Mind you, I'm being just sort of uh, mechanical and cold about this for good reason. And then on to we forget because life goes on, you move into other things, and then we regret because then we become nostalgic in our in our limited mortality and look back on things fondly that we can never achieve again, yet we want again because we can't accept more, more mortality. That's... Uh, I, I can't tell you how broad and, and such a... 
in such a succinct way he was able to put the human condition. I'm sorry, that's that's one of the most brilliant things I think I've come across in 96 albums. Yeah, episodes. Unfortunately, it's the it's the brilliant bright spot in a lot of not as brilliant. Oh, stuff. granted, this is a momentary, but again, this is why when our year in reviews, we're able to look toward songs and and take moments as opposed to albums. In right. in terms of mount of of the album scale here, it's gonna bump it up for me. But yes, there are other things. Conversely, that will drag it down. And, um, but uh, I'm telling you, this is a phenomenal end to the first disc, at which point, yes, we're far in the podcast here, but we still have a whole nother disc, at which point we get to explore that. So she disc, loves us. This is disc two, track one on disc two. Or should I be more energetic? There's an exclamation. She loves us. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know. This song, to start us, just to prepare you, if you haven't listened and you listen track by track as we review track by track, is 17 minutes and one second. Yeah, now you can tell he's upset at this song because he's, he's quoting seconds. I want them back. The, the, I love the first 30 seconds of this song. So, yeah, the <laughs> intro, the, the first 30 seconds of the intro are actually interesting and feel like they're going to go somewhere. Back to the semi-jaunty kind of. <laughs> yes, but the problem is... After that 30 seconds, that same intro continues for another minute and a half. Yeah, the semi-jaunty for much too long. Much too long. And the loops, and loops, and yeah. loops. And then it goes into another great semi-jaunty intro that lasts another three minutes. Honestly, there's one part of the song between approximately 7.40 and 9.10 that I really, really enjoy. Well, you're, you're jumping ahead here. I, I, I that's some... the, but that's the only part of the song that that's, I really like. That's more than me and Steve could I specifically say. picked out that area because I liked it. All right, but well, let's see what we get here. it over the next ten minutes. Let's see, yeah, let's, let's see what we get here because at least in the beginning there's a little bit more variety. Um, to follow that, that jaunty intro here, starting at about a minute 30 seconds, we look at a little bit of interesting guitar comps, but again, they're kind of here and there at that point. There's a little bit of a tone here that's interesting. It's a little bit exotic, a little bit eastern san- sounding, although I can't say exactly how far east. Um, a touch of jingling to it. I think I, f- I hear that somewhere in there. But apart from the little bits of color here and there, once the jingling started, this was even more repetitive and more exhausting than the intro. And that lasts until the four-minute mark. And at this point, yes, I can I can sufficiently say I was hating this track because there was no real meaning behind it. There was nothing I could really sink my teeth into. I wasn't gauging anything uh, emotionally um, or, uh, as we just described, you know, revealed the, the uh, cold truths of humanity or anything. So I'm not feeling the, the powerful or, or the... Or the non-powerful. It's just... It was nothing at this point. It seemed just noise for the sake of noise. Well, it, it should be pointed at, out... At four minutes, though, there is revolu- uh, a resolution of sorts. And oh. we are going to get something a little bit contrasting. Because there's another sound bite. Sirens. They step in here. It's, again, kind of that like upward bend in the guitar and whatnot. It's a contrasting sound. But of all the stupid sirens... Seriously, this was like a, definitely a mimicry... Of air raid sirens, I think, with the guitars, but they seem to serve no purpose whatsoever. This is more along the lines of of what we I was talking about when you were pointing out Matt uh, the the courtesy soundbite that we yeah. hear in various other music. It's not something that I liked from the beginning, and I didn't like it at the end. I didn't like it, it had no purpose in context. We got some good little bits in it. You want to get to that seven minutes, don't you? The seven well, minutes, my biggest, 40 seconds. My biggest problem also is they bring in a guitar, but they do absolutely diddly with it. And they had such, they've done such great guitar work on this record, even in moments where I didn't like the track. The guitar work stood apart. But in this, we get, you know, a strumming guitar, and after the first three strums of a thousand strums, it's like, oh, great, three strums, great, oh, yeah. a thousand more times, fuck you. It's a, like, it's a two chord progression. It's not it's even, the worst. There's no progression. It's, it's just obnoxious. Well, a lot of these tracks don't really have a progression, per se. I mean, it, it, they, they're, they're, they are very limited in terms of what they do for minutes on end. But, but... It builds part of a bigger picture. Yes, yes, yes. It's they like do. a single brush... Uh, brush, the brush blah, 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 a single brush stroke. <laughs> We're going to go back to the brush That's being done over and over. Well, this is art. <laughs> it's done over and over and over again. But it can still paint a picture. And here, this is a mallet 
with paint on the end being smashed in the same spot of a wall over and over and over again. Yeah. Then you get a new mallet in red instead of blue and you smash into another part of the wall over and over and over again. Now let's it's not drums. painting a picture. Not for paint. It's just doing something. Yeah, no, that's exactly how I felt in this track here. And actually, come to think of it, like... <sighs> staggered drum work. It's funny I mentioned drums a second ago because there's another section here. I think this is actually just prior to the moment that I, I was really... Um, kind of lost on but the staggered drum work was interesting to an extent but boy this was this was a rhythm that you really just could not quite grapple with it's something that that really intentionally was trying to throw you up at every single instance it wasn't it wasn't um there was a case earlier on this album where there was that i think it was in the very second track where you had drum work that would slowly leave that six eight and whatnot and i was really enjoying that but it's because it would always find itself again that i love the exploration of the of the variety within uh within something that has an orderly framework this was this was pure avant-garde at this point in the percussion level and then i mean it just went on and on and on like wrecking balls for minutes on end this actually did have have a percussiveness to it but it was this it, it really sounded like a wrecking ball hitting a building. And it happened every measure uh, on the measure. It, it, again, I really can't, can't discern a purpose. That's not texture. That's not, no, you're right. That's not, well, it is texture. But again, well, it's, it's texture without context. And there was no yes, substance. Exactly. None. No substance. It was just noise for the sake of noise. And I'm sorry, I don't care how jammy you get. Noise for the sake of noise is not pleasing. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good I mean, point. It wasn't really it, they, jammy. Yeah, that's something that kind of was lost on this song. You could have said, I mean, perhaps that's something that could have tied this together if there was actually like a jam going on. And I don't know, I don't often hold jam bands very much as the kind of thing that can save music. But that, of all times, this was the time for it. A fluctuation in the chord, there were so many things that were missing from here that were in the other songs. I know things. Even, are, I know things are bad when I actually start making up my own melodies sun. to things. Even well, bring the sun had variations. Oh, it did. This was just stagnation. Let's also not forget those brilliant lyrics. You know, like Mao, and Mao, Mao, Mao. All right, let's just read this out. <laughs> let's, okay. Come on, John. Come on. I am no thing. Wait, I don't even know where we are. <laughs> I am no There's, thing. I no am thing. no one. Come to my mouth. Come, Come to, to my, my tongue. tongue. I am I your, your girl. girl. I am your son. Come to my house. I can't. Come to my lung. Come to my house. Come to my mouth. Come to my tongue. It says over and over again. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> I am your girl. I am your son. Come to my mouth. Come to my lung. Fun, fun, fun. Mow, mow, mow. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Wait, wait, No, this is the part I like. This is the part I like. Oh, you like mow, 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 mow. Fuck, fuck, fuck. fuck. Your, your name, name is fuck. fuck. I'm, I'm going, going home. home. I'm, I'm going, going home. home. Hallelujah. 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 It sounds like demented Dr. Seuss for morons. Yeah, that, yeah. I would it's not just listen in awful. the house. Yeah, that. I would not listen in my house. I would not listen with a louse. <laughs> I would not listen with a mouse. I would not listen... You're really bad at that. Yeah. I would not listen here or there. I would not listen anywhere. I do not like this song. It's very good. <laughs> Can we just move along? Yes. That, that, wow, yeah. He made a good one. <laughs> he, he summed it up pretty well. I'm very sissy. He rhymed. But, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, back to um, that thing we do. Chris, uh, Kirsten... Supine. This Supine. one's a ten minute and thirty two seconds. No, so we're, we're we're completely wrapping up with uh, wish she loves us. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah, we're right. This. We're more or less. This just one was on was really. There's a minute and a half that is actually worth listening to, and then it gets repeated about half a dozen times. Real quick, was that the part I I, I noted as the system of a down esque tonality? Yeah. yeah. No, right after that. Right after that. Right after that. Oh well, yeah. whatever. It lasted for ten minutes, and I was done. Either case. Just to put a period at the end of the sentence, there's very little here that I found bold enough, bold enough to be moving. This was not noise rock uh, stated confidently. It was, it was, it was laziness. It was to, noise to my for the opinion. sake of noise. Um, I do realize that in the art sense, we're in the territory of Silvermount Zion, where you can be repetitive and whatnot, but I would take Silvermount Zion any day over this. I find their choices far more astute than what I found in this particular track. And by the way, remember when there was like that overlapping... Uh, yeah. Someone needs to do that to, to, to overlap with me. Uh, yeah, that, 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 exactly. that was there and there. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we found Chuck in the middle of this chunk. Yes. All right, so, yeah, that was Ask Nine as well. <laughs> that was Sloth. Yes. That's right. That's right. Um, so, yeah, so That's moving similar. on to Kirsten Supine. Which is a... Oh, okay, we're going to dwell on this one a little bit. Because number one, number one, 
Intro. That intro is like sliding into a bed made of smooth ice. It is beautiful. This is the kind of lo-fi intro that I, I, I find in various other music in the early 90s. I find it in slowcore. I find it, it, it has potential. It has so much potential here. And although I'm starting to detect a pattern, and I'm also very leery at this point as to what they plan to go into. Um, you do have some performance art following this, which is interesting. Kind of to what you actually get back in in uh, in, in Toussaint de uh, L'Ouverture, which is the clanking in the background, things dropping. It is actually sound bites of things with sort of a prolonged rattle. You hear things dropping, right? And, and then, then you get the rattle as if... They really take their time, too. He loves that, that, that sort of uh, after effect. Found that to be really, really cool. So again, I, I do kind of have a little soft spot for the performance art going on here. That was a very, very interesting moment. Um, also, this is the signature singing style of Michael Gerald that I really enjoy again. It was melodic. His this mo- is where I think we're actually going with this track here. When he goes deeper and more melodic, he has that crooning sound. It's the, really the best way that he sings. Yeah. I feel like it really shows his skill at conveying emotionality just through how he's singing, regardless of what he's saying. Yeah. This is, no, this was great. Aside from even just the melodies, there was a defined bass line, there was defined chordal shifts with the subtleties of comp work that you can actually hear because there's less clutter, clutter in general. It, it was a song. And it, <laughs> it was, was also, It was really not noise rock. It also point. had solid song lyrics, like more typical style, which are just gorgeous. May moonlight fall upon your breast. Maybe we got some Shakespearean here thing going. May God send wick to lick your lips, wind to lick your lips. I love my favorite line. Folding in, folding in, the water sings, the black horse screams. May planets crash, may God rain Rain ash to sear our skin to fold us in. This is, I, I. Oh my God. That's. Holy, just holy crap, man. That's freaking gorgeous. Also, because you know this attacks it from from a uh, a sort of a more of a writing standpoint. It's not just it's not just a beautiful message. It's not just sweet, which is a word that we like to throw around whenever we come across an indie rock band to say that we're that we're kind of into, but we're not gonna really you know hoist really highly, but not put lowly. We throw around sweet a lot. This is so much more. This this brings in the power of wordplay using. Using um, alliteration to your advantage, using meter to your advantage, Solid using just, just inventive metaphor work. Just this is the sonic, old. the sonic capabilities of the English language. That's what I see here in this writing. Granted, it's not everywhere in his work because, of course, when we step into the more noise rock oriented stuff, a lot of it is just used as as refrains uh, within motifs, within rhythmic motifs, as we as, as we've gotten to this point. But this, I, I honestly say, I want more of this. I want more of this in their modern work, especially considering that, as we've said earlier, there kind of is no shortage of bands that have followed in the footsteps of Swans and the Noise Rock front. So, yeah, I kind of want more of their song-oriented stuff, still using their techniques, still using his poetry. But this is really where I think they shine. I, um, I do enjoy also, after this lyrical work, we get a kind of a secondary section to the song. Which which kind of transforms what I said was you know cold yet beautiful. Oh, that's the part. That's, that's the part B. I'm gonna get the just one second because oh, oh, I have yeah, one thing. Else. I have just one thing to say here. Um, just about those chordal shifts here. First of all, I can actually define like like uh, individual chords here. Like it actually has a C major feel, which is why it sounds so overly pleasant. And then it has these moments where it takes a little bit of a dark shift it goes a half i mean a whole step down to b minor just briefly and then it picks it right back up to c major like these little these little sags in its in its blatant uh optimism and then it raises right back kind of like it's trying to 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 psych itself into something but isn't quite always succeeding that's where i get that cold beauty from perhaps that kind of depth to it that is a little bit uh not brittle a little bit Haughty. If that's the word I'm looking for, you know what I mean. I wanna, yeah, I wanna say that's the right word. Okay. I wanna say I'm gonna, I'm gonna be confident in you. Don't, don't disappoint me. Okay. When I get to that dictionary. All right. <laughs> Any case, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty feeling at this point, and I think I'm for thoroughly ready to move on to your part B. Oh. Graciously. Truly turns that into... Apprehensive. Once again, we're going back to uh, an, an eerier tone and more apprehensive tone. Uh, it's not like though. apprehensive is a foreign thing at this point in this yeah, album here. It's not, but it's it's the actual transition itself that is so powerful. The, yes. the the single moment where it moves from part A to point B is one of the greatest moments I think also in this album. Which we're actually we're starting to build up a a, a a decent stockpile of next to our most hated moments. Is the transition at four five minutes and twenty seconds where it actually moves to E here. So, even after going from, like, C to B, C to B, occasionally we drop in a little bit of A, now we're firmly in E, and this is just this deadening trudge. The bass just slowly hammering away while the chime work, and this is actually chime work here, I'm not talking about, um, uh, harmonic, harmonic guitars, no, this harmonics is... and guitars. This is real chimes, Church I think, bells, that they're using, almost. yeah. And they sort of linger above. This, it, it's not necessarily that it's moving into something bold it's that it kind of just sighed its last breath and now it's going to the to the, the cyclical zombie trudge that we described earlier back in uh, back in the end of the last disc I kind of feel that transition here where there we were actually described the whole process of, of life itself this is kind of like the transition, the move from the moment where you're deluded by life to the moment where you are saddeningly realizing your mortality. I know that's a, a, a little bit of a stretch, but honestly that's what I, that's what the music is able to do here. Sometimes the music has the capability of actually trumping the lyrics in that regard. It was brilliant. It was really <laughs> one of the most beautiful uh, things I've ever reviewed on this. That transition. And what was um, so great about it is that after the transition, it wasn't like before where we had perfect moments and they went nowhere. This rebuilt itself. It was a completely different tone that fit perfectly with your part A. Furthermore... There's, it, there's, it's, it's, it's separate, yet there's no divorced nature. Well, right, because life is life. In a sense, you're not really leaving yourself, but you are kind of coming to a realization. And I, 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 I was... I was falsely speaking before because actually this isn't the lyrical content. It's here in the final refrain. I will let it go. I can't let it go. You hear the fight right there. I will let it go. I can't let it go. I won't let it go. I can let it go. That That is, to me, like a, a sort of giving up of, of, a, of a kind of mortal innocence. This song makes the previous message of the previous... Not the previous track, but the, the end of the last It brings disc. it to life. Yeah, it really gives it a life of its own, and it, it, it makes it... It's it the, humanizes it. Yeah, and that clear transition is what really makes it feel so powerful. You're right, it does humanize it, and that's something I think was lacking at the end of the first disc, even though I still think it's one of the more powerful messages. It says it from such a cold standpoint that it's hard to see it in a human light. It's like some non-human person is, is describing it, as you said, zombie-esque, but... <laughs> But here, as you see the transition, it's actually more easier to relate to. It's, so it's an it's, interesting twist on the same concept. Kirsten is realizing some things we do. Yeah. She's internalizing it. It's becoming part of her, of her, of her knowledge, in a sense. That's right. I, it's, I actually it's did a, not even see it originally it's a as, weird, as the... weird but amazing combination of the, the two ideas. of this person. Interesting. And... And from there we're going to... Oxygen. Oxygen. This one track is... Track three, second disc. Seven minutes and 59 seconds long. This track starts out with an aesthetic that's very Primus-esque. It's got the stuttered percussion that Primus made very famous. It's a... Gotta it's agree. A, I, I actually had Steve define it for me. A two-beat triplet in well, the percussion... Just... It gives that it a really, is, really cool edge. It's too many triplets. I mean, that's just my little way of putting it. But it's really it's so many times alluring. you'll hear me describe triplets as it's, the kind of thing, so the enticing. kind of thing that's triplets over one beat, right? You know, three for one. Well, this is basically just three for two. It's the kind of thing that's actually it. It's not. It's not a the most simplest rhythm to 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 reproduce. But then once you get it, it, it it's great. It's it's a nice it's a nice way of sort of being in two different meters at once. This kind of Just that, where one hand is doing one thing, one hand is doing the other thing. Two for three. 
really cool to just follow along to that. I, I, I could be in the state of two B triplets for for quite a long time, and as a piano player, my my hands have often had to do that for extensive periods of time. It's interesting. It's but just it's, an interesting thing. It, the, the choice of the cadence of the beat, coupled with with the actual rest of the song, is just so enticing to me. To so alluring, I can't get past it. Well, it was the it was my favorite aspect of this song. Well, and also from the intro, we get into a more frantic section of the song that only further supports my theory of it sounding Primus esque. I mean, Primus is known from starting with the great groovy rhythm and then going into all hell breaking loose to promote this kind of insanity in in the music, and and this definitely conveys that in the song Oxygen. But I'm, I'm going back to repeating certain. Uh, descriptors here but there is kind of another staggered thrashing at the end again we're no stranger to that at this point kind of going all out then receding a little bit then going all out then receding all a little bit and yeah it it, it does get very manic we kind of go from most of this track i think is actually kind of funky due to that that sort of uh you know two three triplet style or three for two but um it's very long. Admittedly, that does drag out for quite a while. I, I'm, I'm basically okay with it just because it's a cool groove. But then when it starts to get really, really intense, it, it's it, it's interesting only maybe for the way that it really, really ends. And that's kind of with this brass finish. You hear yeah. this, these horns that sort of belt out the this final thrash. And, and over that... Not just the actual thrashing itself, which which features horns, but there's actually a little bit of a solo going on there with like a, a high, a really really high trumpet, um, probably up in the the upper range of what you really would can even procure trumpets. I mean, I mean, the horns were so buried in this mess that it almost didn't sound like a horn at first. It took Steve a little while to actually recognize it as horns because it sounded just like part of this cacophony. And then when, the name is like a piccolo horn or something. And like then that. when the solo happened, piccolo though, trumpet. it really stood out, and you could tell that they mixing horns for the first time in this record on the third track of the second disc. And or it the was eighth like track. If it was counting. like the same reveal with the with you know the second we were introduced the tr- cello. Yes. You know, whenever you're introduced to a new instrument, it's always just a good way to provide variety within something that you know is going to be a long haul. Yeah. <laughs> but the, I did have. This is the first time I liked a song, but I felt it was too long. Yeah, I would. This agree is with the that. first song that I, I, I enjoyed that really did wear on me because of, towards the end it the got it, yeah. Towards the end, the rep- the repetitive nature of the song just started to wear. And if it had ended a whole couple minutes earlier, it probably would have been another flawless song. But but I think I know where the problem is. In in the other songs, the other tracks, we actually well personally. I was able to enjoy the vocals. And here, they were just kind of filler texture. I wasn't getting into into what he was singing. Well, again, as I've said before, my favorite vocal style is when he's crooning. And he only does that on two tracks on this record. So every other time... This was yelling. And I, I hate it when he yells. It's just, it's nonsensical. No, it wasn't it's the screamo. Through. It wasn't the screamo, though. It was yelling. It doesn't matter. I still didn't like it. Yeah, I get it's, that it's it was. I get that it was yelling, but I still didn't like it. It just was jarring, and it's not. It doesn't convey his talent. It's just noise, for the sake of noise, which is my biggest problem with this band. Is whenever they're doing noise for the sake of noise, there's a disconnect. That's for a good me. way to put it. It doesn't convey his talent. That's a. Um, it's a very good way of putting it. I, I mean, screaming is the kind of thing that does go back and forth with a lot of artists. Sometimes you really like that raw power, and it can be well, very it's helpful a up on stage. It's, I find screaming in music is best when it's punctuation. When it's prolonged, yeah. it gets not jarring. When it, not when it, it consumes your verses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I follow you. Um, there are some interesting lyrics here. I do kind of want to throw that out there. Oxygen, amen, oxygen, amen. I can breathe again, I can breathe again. Oxygen, come in, oxygen, come in. Amen, 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 amen. Black oil smoke, thick blue sky, dead red eye, hear me cry. Eat my throat, feed my mind, yellow eye, feed me cry. Yet, you can't really Curious. hear those words. Yeah, it's, it's unintelligible. You're when right. you're screaming to a point that your lyrics become inte- unintelligible, like in a lot of the screamo, it's, it ruins what you're going for. It's also a little abstract in my taste. I think, well, I, I like certain things that are abstract, but this is... I feel this could... Maybe these same lyrics could, could actually have fit 
a slightly different medium, or perhaps a more of a fun medium. You know, granted, I use the word funky for this track very, very loosely. Yeah, a it's two beat triplet alone, as I as I keep repeating, is does not solely make it funky. Really, there is that slight primacy feel, but again, we're really kind of dancing around something that really could be a lot more outright. Now, I know that Swans is not necessarily a it, it, it's not a get up and dance kind of band, but you know what? They could have gone with more of a jaunty, ironic twist on these particular, particular lyrics here. Hey there, dog man. Now I drink from your bowl. Hey there, Mr. Skull. I'm not scared of your cull. Oxygen, amen. Oxygen, amen. Breathe in. Breathe in. There's an interesting quirky yeah. quality to this that I think the music could have the delivery, better represented. The delivery definitely hurt it, and also yeah. the music choice to back it up definitely hurt it. Like the fact that I was straining to hear brass? I could flat out envision a brass ensemble to these lyrics. Yeah. That would have been that would have been a joy to listen to. Um, instead, I just kind of have to scratch my head and wonder. And from you know, there, oh wow, wow! No, I just got flashback to Hey Bulldog. You know, in lyrical something style, in that, yeah, the poetic style of the lyrics are. are very similar. Yeah, maybe subconsciously, I'm thinking something along those lines. Uh, probably a few other things too, although I can't th- think of them at the moment. But either case, yeah. That's kind of where I stand with this, and I think it's where I, I'm going to leave it. Yeah. Mm. Track this four, was... Nathal- Nathalie Neal. So, Nath- Nathalie Neal is another whopping 10 minute and 15 second song. Um, the intro is very much a slow burn. You know, they take this, their no, time no, no, with no. it. This one's a little bit different. This is, again, going back to that Eastern feel, which I said yes. I heard a little bit it's earlier. It's still a slow burn. It doesn't jump right away. No, it you're right. It builds very, very slowly. It takes its time. But in this case, it starts with a more uh, uh, vocal aspect. It's you almost hear this like really, really far away chanting as your first musical instrument. I recall that. Or yeah, singing. That's, yes. that is a lot different. And then on yes, top of that, we get an instrument. The speed of how no, it no. builds. Yeah, that's true. It builds very slowly. But this is a case where I wasn't so bored with it. You know, it builds very slowly, but. The, the intricacies of the build in this case were enough to intrigue me along with the vocalization to not be completely bored. It did still run a little long, but it was more engaging than some of the other slower builds we had had. And also like the each. tone. The yeah. tone which would start to be yeah. built by the, by the sort of sitar-esque instruments, which, uh, you know, again, I say that loosely, I don't believe it's really a sitar, but it kind of has that, it that mimicked, edge to it. It mimicked the style and sound of a sitar, whether it was one or not. Yeah, which effectively gave it the eastern feel yeah, throughout. The, ex- the expansion of this introduction did a lot to, to set up a very hypnotic nature, because this explodes and into a very high energy percussive piece that doesn't lose that hypnotic nature. That's, no, it that's, doesn't. It's Actually the drum work that way. The drum work here I would describe as kind of rounded drum work where it, it I think actually achieves that rounded quality by using volume swells where you sort of create a circular effect by sort of getting loud and then getting soft. And it's actually dynamic shifts that are happening right there. The drummer himself is very dynamic. He is doing those volume shifts. So you don't always think of in terms of, of percussion. You think of it as being steady in volume and simply being being there to keep time. But they are a dynamic instrument. You can tap loud, you can tap soft. I... And this you see this within one single phrase, swelling loud, swelling soft. It feels cyclic, uh, circular to me. And I would challenge that the better drummers are the ones who can do that. I agree. Just keeping time in a rhythm, great and all. And it's the majority of pop music. But what you're really looking for in a dynamic drummer is the ability to ebb and flow. And it's definitely here. Right, and the ability re- to adapt to the, tra- to the song itself. And in, a, and in music like this, I have to say, one of my favorite features of the entire record is the drummer. He... In the moments where he's keeping a steady beat, he's still trying to do something a little different. And in a moment like this where he could have just simply kept a steady beat here and it would have had an okay effect, but he decided to take it to the next level and give it some more texture that boosted this this song to a different place. Right. And that place was almost prayer-like. And the reason I state that is because the vocals and the lyrics... The vocals are beseeching, and the lyrics are just calling out to a loved one. It's, it's a, 
And for that reason, a, you, you a couldn't... A really amazing ach- level. I feel like you couldn't achieve that uh, without being melodic, in which case we, we do have... This is another track where he... You know, it's back to melodies, and obviously I'm... I'm I'm, I'm pining for that at yeah. this point in the album. Whenever he brings in a melody, so far it's been a success, you yeah. know, as opposed but to just is, kind of exploring the in-betweens. Forceful hypnotism. This is yeah. delving deep into it, and it's just, it comes off not quite, like, religious, but in the same sort of vein of of uh, praying to something or someone. Well, it's, it it's becomes really almost powerful. cult-esque worship. This kind of hypnotic blind fervored. worship, fervored, fervored worship. Yeah. I wouldn't say cult because that has the negative connotation. Well, let's look in here. But fervored, yes. Love is strong. Love is long. Live forever in this song, Natalie. Kill the cruel. Heal the blind. Cut your name onto the sky, Natalie. Scatter joy. Steal the light. Dance upon the useless lie, Natalie. Love is strong. Hate is gone. There you are. <laughs> uh, live forever in this song, Natalie. And it's the, the, the subsequent repetitions of these, uh, the mantra-like nature of, hey, it does, hey, hey, Natalie. It does it's, feel like someone at a pedestal preaching, in a way. You're just preaching for, for the goodness or badness or whatever. Hmm. You know, and it, it's, it's a very powerful it's and definitely, quite moving. It's definitely a singular person speaking to a mass. That's very, very, very clear here. And I, I love it for it. I love it. Even though I'm I not might, a very religious person, per se. I might actually twist it's, you it's around, kind of, though, a little bit. I, I want to say that maybe it's it's different. It's more like a mass speaking... To one person. Namely God. Yeah. I mm. feel like this is more like a mass... Um, a mass, I do not just like mass in church, but like a mass prayer. I can see that. that a makes group sense. praying for one person. The, yeah. this, instead this, of just, to one person. Maybe. There's multiple ways you could take it. Yeah, this one was not. I would so argue clear. this is not clear yeah, cut. This on is that not aspect. clear cut. It's kind of where your head is at and where your perspective comes. Just I feel this in the broadness of these of, of some of these prayers: kill the cruel, heal the blind. I mean, that's so that's so that's, mass. Yeah. No, I totally understand that. I mean, but, but all in all, I'd say I really enjoyed this track. I, I definitely. I mean, it definitely had. You know, it's uh, lacking a little on the substance end for me. Yeah, I mean, I I see the basic concept behind here, but you know, again, could be different lyrics, could be different music. You know, you could kind of trade them off here. It's more like one of those just average tracks. But when you're feeling down about this track, just remember it's not track one. <laughs> on the flip side, not track one no, of this no, disc. No, yeah, actually, this disc, yes. Actually, I would I would say that this song is for me one of the most emotionally powerful songs I disagree I still think track 5 from disc 1 was more emotionally powerful you could just say track 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 no it's two discs with 5 tracks on each it didn't pierce my memory in the same way that that other tracks did agreed that's a Uh, great way of wording it well okay definitely not as good as some things we do or Kirsten but still I found it to be quite Uh, powerful no more playing favorites let's finish this up To Be Kind track 5 we have our title title track. track at the very end so this one is a whopping 8 minutes and 23 seconds. And honestly, even though that's not the shortest track on the album, at this point I'm relieved it's at least not 15 minutes. <laughs> um, to Be Kind, in its introduction, has this kind of airy ambiance to it. It reminds me, I was telling Steve, of like a 60s or 70s kind of horror film setting this kind of black and white kind of mass grave scene and you know just lurking funny how I think that's how I saw the first track on the whole entire album interesting but But I do actually I detected more of a more of a a, more of an airiness to this we we, we had a kind of a cloudy feel everything feels very ethereal at this point and it's definitely probably their most ethereal yet on the album it seems like kind of a sigh that such that maybe Things are not as pivotal as they once were. You know, again, I'm speaking in very broad terms here, but it, 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 well, it seems like this is some kind of relief. The well, album. Th- yeah, this track is trying to give this kind of atmospheric release to kind of take you through to the end. Well, that's. I think that's because in the previous track, or the previous even two, three tracks, the eerie quality is gone. That's true. It's been actually the, being conspicuously absent for a while. Uh, not not completely absent, but especially in track nine, it's gone. 
Yeah. This... There was a point here where we were coming up to, you know, trying to think up of, uh, of different ways to say eerie and creepy, and then all of a sudden we stopped saying Eerie, them. creepy, frightening, these words are no longer there. This is now not really hopeful, but contemplative. This, it's becoming, it's become more kind of concrete. Well, it's curious because we're already at the point now where, where it feels like there has been realization. It feels like like there's been some big existential from, uh, reveal. From Kirsten onward, yes. Yeah. Well, well no, even earlier, I, well, you know, you're right, Kirsten, Kirsten onward, because that's when it actually occurred, I suppose. And his, it, it, it's an interesting fact also about um, the lyrical delivery on this track is when he does start singing, it's unlike every other way style of singing. He has a very unique style of singing in this song. It comes across almost theatrical in this it reminded me of some of the solo songs that I can't remember the actor's name who played him, but in Scrooge, the musical, the British one, with Alan Guinness, though not Alan Guinness's songs, the guy who played Scrooge sings these songs in a sing songy, crotchety kind of way, and that kind of emotion comes through here. I think that's also the reason he's delivering the songs, is because if you've just come through a giant existential crisis, crashed and burned, and then picked yourself back up, you're going to struggle. To put your words in a fluid manner, and I think that's what he's trying to convey with this style of singing. Mm-hmm. If if you just realize what the world's really about, quote unquote, and all of your delusions are gone and whatever, your imagination is destroyed and you're stuck with reality, I think he'd be a little crotchety. Yeah, it would lend to a Scrooge type archetype, and, and that's the way he's delivering the lyrics. It's like the, everything is else is done too in the music in the in the very beginning. Everything is. Like we said, airy and out there, and he's angry. Yeah. A little bit of anger. There's because bitterness. There, yes, bitter, not anger. Yes. But the, the, the lyrics themselves are not, you know, bitter or anger. They're kind of forlorn. You know, I read a review where actually it came across this final track and seemed to present it as a real sag in the album because we've had so much energy up, up till this point, uh, which... I could I could kind of see, but of course we've had we've had positive energy. We've also had really really negative energy. Um, a lot of that energy I think was still very much needed, although it could have been stated differently. Either case, I think it's kind of a harsh uh, way to see this outro. I don't really see how else this album could have ended, given its theme work, without a sort of note of acceptance. Upon a second listen, this track is the perfect climax to this album, and it's because of. Moments like in the fifth track of the first disc, where you're you're burning out on how just almost hopeless life seems to have become. So once you realize that, there's nowhere to go but to into this morose acknowledgement, and this track really conveys that it also, quite well. It also has a kind of a concert theatrical level of ending in its repetition of a sort of white noise build up and then depletion then build up and depletion over and over again there are a lot of moments on the tail end of this record that we all agreed even though they don't work perfectly on an album they would work a lot better live and this is one of them I would love to see the finality of this show yeah because it would be be, da 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 dun da 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 dun just the likes going up down up down people just exuberant depressed exuberant depressed at the end of this uh, at the end of this show because it's doing its best to really just just create that conflict that has been built into this album the conflict of emotions of of of, of bitter accepting and i don't know everything i think we're ready to wrap up why don't you take us into it steve not it well, it's your album. You don't go first. If you haven't learned by now, audience, the person who chooses the album never goes first. Though they also get the choice to go to to, to go help. first. To if go they first or last. If they want. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. That's true. It's John's day. <laughs> I get to interject. Okay. Um, I detect a slightly mechanical feel to this album. Except for some parts that are so raw, they're animalistic. Unless you, of course, interpret organic processes as something that's mechanical in itself. In which case, bupkis. <laughs> but I think that's actually the essence of the album. That is the theme. That we're looking at something that really kind of reduces humanity 
in such a way that maybe it makes you appreciate it a little bit more. I think it's a powerful message, and I think it's where I'm I'm, I'm sticking theme-wise. Um, it's not that that's never been done. I mean, it really... It, I, frankly, I don't even think this is the first Swans album that is existential. I'm pretty sure their previous work uh, kind of broached that, if not encompassed that. In which case, we're looking at something a little redundant, but don't hold me to that. Not to mention, of course, the fact that there's a lot of other existential work out there. So again, I don't really see this as something new. We're looking at something that's modernist, and we don't live in a modernist world. We live in a postmodernist world. Uh... <laughs> use the term not terminology i mean <laughs> the, the idea is born out of probably the origin of humanity when people started getting a little bit antsy and started thinking about their place in the universe and then we actually gave it a name in the late 19th century i'm oh i've always been a little bit dubious on the philosophy um even though it's something that we all have to grapple with i don't think it's something that always needs to be hammered home that said, you can still do beautiful artwork surrounding it. I flat out think the that um, the final track of the first disc is one of the mo- th- some things we, we do is flat out one of the most brilliant tracks or the most broad spectrumed tracks that we have come across. And there are several other tracks here that even though they don't wow me in the same way, they support it. Beyond that, I'm kind of looking at other things in this album, sporadic things. I'm looking at things earlier on in the album that I liked just for the musical quirks. In other words, forget about theme, forget about context, forget about all that. They were pleasant to the ear. And I could actually put them on and just kind of sit through it for a few hours. There's, this, this is the th- kind of thing you need to look at when you're looking at the noise rock brand of music here. It is background mo- noise to some extent. Yes, there are people, and yes, I am sometimes one of them, who will actively listen to this, and it's kind of a prerequisite for this podcast, but we're trying to come at this from multiple angles, uh, where you actually place the earphones on your ear and you focus actively for the duration of the entire album. Yes, that means all two discs, even the 34-minute track. And just see what it delivers you without really focusing on anything else. Look at every little intricacy and just see how it washes over you. There are moments on this album where that's going to hit home big time. Transitions here and there that were very astute. I'm going back to that word. Astute, I think, is the the way you need to treat an album like this because you're dealing with something that is not constrained by time. You're dealing with something that has ample time. So how are you going to... How are you going to treat your audience? Are you, are you going to... Are you going to ignore the fact that your audience even exists and just do what you do and do whatever feels right in the stream of consciousness setting for half an hour on end, or in this case, the the entire of the album, two hours on end? That would be really cruel. It would be cruel to your audience, and it seems kind of like you're getting away with murder. Or are you going to parcel off momentary pieces of brilliance and and simply more to think about, I think, for your audience? I think this album does do that in spurts, but then it gets lazy. Then it does it in more spurts, then it gets lazy. Occasionally it has the capacity to do it for entire tracks, and then it has the capacity to ignore it for entire tracks. Of all the split down, in the middle albums, if it weren't for the, for the theme, this would be a perfect three for that exact reason. But there is a theme here, and it is an important one, even if a little redundant, I gotta count it in. And bump this up to a three, two, five. Okay. Um, my biggest problem with this album is what. My biggest problem is probably one of their biggest talents that they commit. They commit to an idea, even if it's not really working for them, which I guess is part of art. To stick with an idea, no matter where it takes you, because it's your bread and butter. However, my biggest problem with this album is that I flat out didn't enjoy a lot of it. It was unentertaining and uncomfortable to listen to. And while by tracks, the percentage of what I liked is possibly closer to 50, the amount of time spent listening is closer to a quarter of it. Or maybe a third. Um, Because the reality is, one of the tracks on the first disc is 30 minutes long, 34 minutes long, whatever it was. And I didn't really like any of it. And I know that there were good parts in it, and there were redeemable qualities, but the reality is I was so harsh by the first ten minutes that the other 
24 minutes and something seconds weren't enough for me. And we've had plenty of albums we've brought on here where one moment ruins a tail end of an album. Um, it's happened countless times, actually, on songs that were shorter than this. That said, the theme in uh, Some Things We Do is probably one of the most brilliant themes we've had on the podcast, I agree. Um, which helps the album on, on its whole, but it's not enough of a merit for me to enjoy the album as a whole. I like the second disc better overall, but that's also because that monster track was on the first disc and was a large chunk of time to give up. Um, I just don't know that I can rate it as high. Like, part of me wants to say, oh, well, they're not a below-average band because there's clearly talent here. But then again, there are so many tracks where there's blocks of noise that feel like talentless conglomerates of garbage. And, you know, I don't know that I can call them average when they go to such extremes. Um, and the reality is there's a little personal taste. I don't... I, I, I like some noise rock, but I'm not as much of a fan of it as Steve might be. Um, and for sure... I'm just harsher. That's the only thing. Yeah. When I'm looking at noise rock, I am a little bit harsher in my ratings because I'm, I'm careful to know that they can get away with murder. Yeah. That's about it. Um, but the reality is also my favorite singing style that he does he does on three tracks there's ten tracks I didn't like the vocals on a bunch of other tracks it's just the, the, the sum of the parts there were great parts but it's some that it built even with the theme wasn't enough for me because there is a strong theme towards the end of the record but even in the first couple of tracks the theme is kind of uh, ethereal it's not really there. It solidifies and manifests towards the end of the first disc and throughout the second disc. Which, I mean, other albums have done too. But I just don't feel like the theme, even in this, is strong enough, especially with some of the nonsense lyrics and the strange music choices, to really solidify a cohesive theme. If it was just the second disc or just the f last track on the first disc and then the second disc, the theme is much tighter there. Much, much, much tighter. But it's not. Those other songs exist too. So the theme isn't perfect for me. We already covered that I don't enjoy it. I only emotionally connected with like two songs, which is a big deal for me. Albeit, the song I connected emotionally with was one of the most emotionally impactful songs we've listened to this year. And it was devoid of emotion, which is what gave it an emotional impact. I only interject... To say what you said before that that the theme is brilliant and probably one of the most brilliant we've we've done, I don't I don't agree with that necessarily. I don't think this is the most brilliant theme because I think it's too easy of a theme. I think it's I think his manner of delivering this theme is very unique, very bold, and something that everyone should check out at some point. I don't believe the concept of simply we are mortal and human and. And, oh, and, oh, and oh, these nay, facets nay, nay. of and these facets of humanity are fleeting. I don't think that that concept alone uh, constitutes brilliance. It has been done. It will be done to the end of time. But my brilliance is not about the concept because doy, it's been done till the end of time. People know that if they didn't listen to music. The brilliance is in how it's executed. That's what I'm talking about. And this is a unique execution. Okay, you didn't say that. You said brilliant theme. So I say execution. Well, execution of the theme was brilliant. Saying that the theme has been done before, that could be spoken of a lot of music. No, you're right, but a I just lot, don't want to attribute swans to having, you know, invented existentialist thought. That's the only thing. No, it just was a brilliant way to to present it. Okay. All right. Be that as it may, it doesn't save this record for me. It's a 2.5. The biggest hurt is that most of the album, for me, was void of emotion, except for those two or three particular tracks. And that's a big detract for me. I'm not saying that you can't find emotion in it. I'm just saying I didn't, and I think the average listener wouldn't either. Um, it's a 2.5. It's not the worst thing we've ever heard. And I think that if there was more cohesion in the noisier parts, though that may take away from noise rock, I might have rated it fairer. The theme is just not enough to carry me through. It, it just couldn't save the fact that I lacked emotion in places, and that I just downright hated chunks of it. I do believe a mature listener, or at least a, a listener looking to be more more mature in their music tastes, should check out this album, because it will probably reveal things. And I, so to say that the average listener won't find it is kind of very... It, it goes back and forth. It really depends on the person and where they are in their, in their musical evolution. There is... 
a problem with this album for me personally. Dramatic pause. On the one hand, there's uh, honestly eight out of ten of these tracks are, in my opinion, downright amazing. Uh, maybe not throughout, but conceptually and in a large majority of what they're doing. Just awesome. Two songs I just don't like in the least. Those two songs do comprise 51 of the 121 minutes, so technically it's a lot of the album. But this is a technicality. The theme you guys are coming here is, 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 is deeper than even what you said. This is a personal individual transforming from naivety to naivete, naivete into reality. This is a person undergoing from just a little boy into an uh, 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 understanding and knowledgeable individual in life. There is that progression. And it's at the halfway mark. It's at that break in the actual two CDs that you get that flip. It's an, it really is a lot more solid than just pure ex, existential, uh, blah, 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 blah. existentialism. Existentialism. It's a personal existential crisis. That, number one, is really awesome for me. But even that's not unique. In no, a but sense. that's really awesome. That's really cool oh, that it has that. Oh, right. it has it's true. That I can't name feeling. a lot of music, like that offhand that has. It's existential, subject. but it's pers- It feels personal, which is usually really a weird usually it seems to, to me to be conveyed in music alone. This seemed to have a very clear tie-in with the with the lyrics, and yes, that was interesting. Number two, like I said, I loved a lot of the music here, but I, I put it to I put it to our listeners the same way I put it to. Stephen Matt before we did this I don't know if it's brilliant or if it's bullshit it's both really when it comes down to it because some of it I just I just detest and hate I love that phrasing yeah it's amazing it's got tidbits of awe like awe not awesome awe A-W-E just amazing little pieces we talked about a transition that honestly may be one of the, the most that I could write a paper on as we put it in the past. We had a moment that is truly beautiful in a song. And that was not the only moment. But there was some bullshit. It's but for the, all it's, that... It's about the changes and not about the not about the substance sometimes, I yeah. think, in this album. And the changes were, were just great. The builds were great. In, in, in so many cases, the builds, like... We, we don't go on about that. Yeah, not really a whole lot of melodies, but not layering, but actual creation of the music here was pretty damn good. It's a solid four for me. It really is just a great... I love it. And then I get a half hour of bullshit, so I'm knocking down to a 375. <laughs> it's a 375. Because he saw our if, look. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I was going to be straight up for but when I look at it, there is 51 minutes of stuff I don't like. That's half the actual time of the album, just about. If I can say I'm going to skip, you know, that much of an album every time I listen to it, I can't. I got to, I got to, I got to knock it down. It's a 375. I'm comfortable with that, and especially, it, it should, I believe that the final average should be above a three, and as it stands, it will be. Mm-hmm. So, Yes. Um. Yeah, I, I would feel very wrong if the final average honestly went down below a three because there's a lot, lot, a lot to get from this album. Uh, it's really only guilty thing is what I said before about the noise rock thing. You can get away with a lot. You can get away with a lot with just sort of spouting for a while and losing track of your substance. Granted, the lyrics are there, but then the music suffers and it just it it wears on you for for. For minutes on end, and I, I, I personally, and this goes back to deep chord. To be honest, I don't think uh, any album should necessarily get away with that. Otherwise, it ruins the album as an art form for the average listener. And certainly, the album has gone by the wayside. Uh, in general, in the last, in in the years it's been around, because now we're of the internet age, and we go for specific songs. 
and it seems like we're losing track of the longer art form, the, the extensive art form, the longer tracks, and, or the longer pieces in general, and it's something I, I would really like to discuss, uh, but very quickly, buy it, or listen to it, what's your thing? So, uh, it, it, it obviously wouldn't be a burden, there's a lot of content and quality on here, so it would be a crime to say that it's not worth listening to at all, because that's not true. It's not only really worth listening to, I think that since these these general wrap-ups are meant for the average listener, I think even the average listener can find something in moments of this, so it's definitely worth hearing. The average listener should also be exposed to the to the subject matter that is noise rock. And that's um, something we love to talk about, exposing you. But, yes. I will say that it's not worth buying because you run the risk of buying something that you will hate half of. And when you buy an album that you hate half of, it's a lot of money still these days to spend on something you will hate half of. And it's a double disc, it's probably more money. Yes. So I would recommend listening to it. Give it a shot. Then if you like it, purchase it. But on the average, yeah. it's definitely worth it's hearing flat out. An, it's flat out not an album for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's, absolutely. That's it in a nutshell. Um, now back to that subject matter. Longer songs. That's to put it, that's to put it um, in a really specific way. I want to expand this, of course, to longer art forms in general. Longer... longer pieces of music art. For instance, you get cases where we re- release EPs that are an entire track unto themselves, like which that could be at half an hour or whatnot. We're talking really the 10 minutes up here. I have a, a good affinity for, for long songs. We Going back to Wall Street Players, I remember uh, Alon, also known as Future Money, also has um, a nice affinity for long songs. I, it, it It's the kind of thing that really reaches, I think, a more patient person. If you're the kind of person that 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 really struggles to 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 uh you know with a kind of attention to deficit then of course it it it's not going to be the thing for you and mass market culture seems to surround that sometimes and as swans showed us today like james joyce if anybody's ever read james joyce i'm sorry you can either be loved and beloved or hated and detested because length <sighs> People have problems with attention spans. It's just a thing of ours. Length can it can be a big determining factor, even if it's only a 30-second difference. But once you start tra- talking about the actual long song bracket, 10 minutes plus... At that point, it actually becomes a, a, a percentage of your life. Yeah. <laughs> we don't think of three-minute pop singles in such a fashion. Who doesn't have three minutes on their hand? Who doesn't have two minutes on their, ha- on their hand? It's... It it comes and goes, so of course that's as digestible as they possibly come. But people really do start thinking as they get up above a certain moment. It's like, do I really want to spend time on this, or do I want to look up random thing on the internet? Do I want to play a game? Do I want to watch TV? Do I want to go distract myself with something else I'd rather be doing than listening to this? As a musician, that's somewhat of a sin. But face it, not everyone's into the same things. You gotta be aware of it. Yes, but also the length of a song is sometimes completely irrelevant. What I mean is, in this example, there were long songs on this album that didn't feel long. We grooved with it the whole time, we enjoyed it, the length was almost irrelevant. And then there are songs that felt like they were never going to end. And that has less to do with the actual length of the song, although in some cases could be because of the repetitive nature of this extended song. Or it's half hour long. But it can also just do with the quality of the song. I find that a good quality song, regardless of length, is still worth listening to and engaging. And that's the key. If you're going to make a long song, you have to find a way to keep it fresh from beginning to end. In general, I concur. On, a, on, a, on an artistic standpoint, I think that's absolutely the case. You need to find something where context is key. That's why I harp on that word, because it really is, like I said, it's a bracket for your, for your given track. It's a way to really unify it front to back and give it its own individual arc, its own exposition, its own development, and its own conclusion. Its own, that is what really ties together music and makes us relate it to a story, in a sense, a tale that's being told. And if it's told well, there will be no wasted second. There will be no moment that is fleeting, no moment that is that is dragging, no moment, no moment that suffers because of its time. That's the ideal for a long track. But of course, that relies on a real keen focus 
of the composer themselves or the artist themselves. They need to be they need to believe in their art form. They need to focus for the duration of the work and ensure that they're being true to the core idea. And sometimes even if they think they are, you got to face it. If you're going to be as broad as possible, you need to remember the moments uh, that that may appear like they're dragging to specific audiences and tailor make them to a certain extent. But if you want your your work to succeed and be popular. But you also have to consider that tracks in general are made man-made construction. They are created in the age of records and then CDs to divide up the music. Whereas I'm sure before recorded music, there were a lot of melding. I mean, there were still songs, I'm sure, but tracks specifically and track length is a man-made construction. Mm. And what I'm getting at is there is a band called No Effects, which I'm sure you're both familiar with, at least somewhat. They yeah. released an album back in the early 2000s. I think it was called The Decline. The Decline had multiple songs, but it was one track. It was one 30-minute and something second track, but there were clearly different songs on it and different titles, but there was no track list, and it was one giant track. So now, does that mean it's one song? No. I mean, we had an example on this album where it was clearly two songs on one track. There's that divide. Or like Pharrell a few weeks ago. Pharrell, um, what was it, Lost Queen, and then the following track after. That's becoming gradually more common to include the slash between tracks that are are so divided in their their overall uh, tone or just delivery that you need to accept them as two different tracks. But they have such seamless transitions that they would never be divided against each other on right. you know from track to track the so I- just put a slash the idea that you want this continued recording because right. there's a cohesiveness to the song right that is, that is more common but i agree with what you're saying before it, it's there is definitely a, a norm that you have to challenge and with what you're saying about no effects they, what you said, what was it what was it again it was an album that consisted of just one track one track the, one track all the songs were one the track album. That that's tantamount to a symphony, yeah. in a sense. Well, without the all the instruments, but yes, it's it's it is that bold, it's that broad, and that challenges the norm, which, frankly, mass media culture has no place for. You're right. That's man-made invention <laughs> that doesn't really lend itself to the individual very much. Well, I think it's sort of gone by the wayside. You got to remember. Yeah, the the invention of CDs and cassettes and vinyl. To break up the songs or, or what really caused this. Yeah. Even when these things became popular, it didn't stop artists from cutting from from making those super longs. One of my favorite songs growing up is uh, "Voodoo Child" by Jimi Hendrix, and that's like a fourteen minute track. That is the original is, version. Yeah. is fourteen minutes. The radio version is only about four or five. The end by The Doors. Same thing. It's an Stairway 11 and a half minute song. Bob Dylan has done a bunch of them. I mean, these these classic Light, Light guys. Light My Fire nears there. I think it's like yeah. nine minutes. But well, the it's reality an exceptionally is... long solo. You have to make exceptions for things like that, too. There's art forms where it's definitely more acceptable than other art forms. Of course, as we follow it, we're to- when we're talking about mass media culture, yeah, we're talking pop music. We're talking about the music that's that's for everyone because it assumes that it's the most digestible music that exists out there. So for them, yeah, you're not going to have crazy solos. You're going to have constrained uh, art forms, constrained p- packaged products that that aren't tailored to as many people as they can possibly get it to. But I would argue that that's not as prevalent now. And the reason is because radio stations aren't as influential as they used to be. When it, when it was about selling airtime, you needed those short tracks. Commercial, song, commercial, song, 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 commercial. You needed time for the sponsors as well. So you need those short, concise songs. You could stick the ad and add in and plan out everything. Now in an internet culture where we still get our ads through YouTube and through other places, but the song has no effect because the ads are forced to run in the case of YouTube. So... In this new generation, a lot of bands are going back towards recording longer songs. Because when you have an internet fan base, like take, for example, one of our favorites, Steam Power Giraffe. They often on their albums have songs on the longer side. Longer for, for, for digestible music, five, four, five, six minutes. And that's because most of their popularity is through the internet and through YouTube. And their live performances, which are incredibly theatrical. Right. And, and there's the aspect of the electronica which really doesn't care about length in the long haul. 
Especially when you talk remixing. Oh, but see, that's, They'll go, that's not the, the DJ. only genre. There's so no, no, many but, genres but that don't specific, care. But specifically, the DJ just makes songs until they're done. They make them as long as they want. Well, they, they never that really could also be intended for you know a dance floor setting, in which case, yeah, you could... I mean, theoretically, you could just have, have a, a, a deluded audience group to something for as long as they're uh, effectively deluded by it. But before they're mouse, bored. But Dead Mouse and Skrillex don't do things like that. But what I wanted to rewind, to rewind to is, is when you, you started to mention radio culture as dwindling, and of course it is dwindling, <laughs> but it'll still be around in a certain extent, to a certain extent, and you still have satellite radio and whatnot, yes. We accept they are focused on cramming as much music as they possibly can into their into their time frame which is which is all day so just put as much in that they can get as much as uh as much of a variety as possible i suppose let's talk about one other thing though you said records before let's mm-hmm. talk about removable media yes it's gone going on its way out but there's still a really strong defense for the cd because people like to have a physical copy and it's also easier of, to share. Yes. One of my biggest uh, rants ever is that the album artwork is invaluable. It lists information that you can't always find online. and You can get album artwork online. You, people often download it with there and they can see it on their iPod. But it's not the same. The physical media, I feel like, just has a level of quality. It's more, it's more about the innards of the book jacket, I think. That, yes. that is something you can't really get. Or, or I'm sure, actually, that's right around the corner, to be honest. I think there's there's definitely going to be a way in which you're going to have a little option on your iPod where you can... And they, this may very well already be out, but there will be a more a more unified option to select your artist, and there will be a nice little button on the upper right-hand corner where you could see all this stuff right there. So even that stuff is not necessarily a defense to me, except for people that are just obsessed with their physical libraries. And th- it does iTunes already has, like, the timestamps and the year published and the composer listing and everything like that. Um, not on all of their music, but on most of what you buy directly from them, you get all that information. Right. And they allow you to put on things like uh, the actual lyrical content, to edit it, and to fool around with it, to make it, you know, as customized as you want it to be. Right, but what I'm talking and about... And iPod doesn't display that, though. No, they that's choose the not thing. to at the moment, yeah. and maybe that's still a, a, a secret defense of the... Um, they're probably contracts and, and whatnot. No, the information's there, though. You just can't actually see it. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah. Either case, though, it it is going to happen in the near future. But I'm actually talking about the length of time that exists on removable media. There's really no stopping at this point, although there's still the... Cl- I mean, CDs is an interesting thing. When you make a CD using the using the RIFF standard, which is, is has been in place for a long time now with CDs, we're not going to talk about records, because records obviously have an endpoint. You can only cram in so many grooves. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, tapes have an endpoint. At some point, the reel ends. Although, fun fact... I did hear that they just recently released a magnetic tape, yes, the old school magnetic tape, that can hold up to, I think it was somewhat upwards of a couple of terabytes of video, of video and, and, audio. and audio data, literally on a tape that is no bigger than the size of your classic cassette. They're doing this, and they still use this. Businesses use it to, to store their awesome. old files and whatnot, because there's, there's a certain... Um, uh, a connection with the older uh, way of retrieving these files. It's good for storage. It's good for o- uh, overall storage. Either way, I had to say that because it clearly is possible at this point, but that's only possible for people with really, really high-end technology. In terms of what you're providing the public, CD players, all right, we've had them for 20 years now, and the RIF set standard still, still maintains that you can only fit a certain amount on track, which is why today's double-disc had to be a double disc. It's odd when you really think about it, because we all know if we compress things a little bit more, or if we simply store formats, or if we released CDs that had a little bit higher uh, higher space on it. The average right now is 700 megs, right? Right. This is obviously a tech talk, but kind of walked into this. This is part of this. That, that right there, to me, is a little strange as to why we're still limiting it, because... As obviously as an MP3 CD, if you compress, you can fit upwards of like 200 well, songs it, on a it, CD or it, more. It might be something as simple as allowing for more minutes ruins the quality. I mean, you can, you still have an amount Not of space Not if you have a higher, a higher capacity CD. Yes, but make... these are also being mass produced, probably cheaply. If we're talking actual produced CDs, 
on mass production end, it's much easier to limit the space and then just pump out these cheaper discs than making the capacity larger, higher quality, bigger tech. Set, costs more money. What about that, a DVD? No, 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 no. A DVD is four gigs, and yet yeah. theoretically you could use a DVD as a CD, but it, it's just that well, not most mo- CD no, players no, no. not in modern CD technology though. A CD no, drive, no, but it's there. See, that's, that's it's the there. Thing. It no, exists. That's the whole. That's the biggest issue. They're actually going to kill themselves that way. CD production is going to be a big issue if you can't create CDs with more than seven hundred meg because. They have the technology that is available. You can make two gig, four gig, six gig music CDs. Well, this is why I'm headed with this because, no, no, in, my, no. in my opinion, but it's going to phase out the CD even faster than it's already happening. No, see, in my opinion, the reason for this is actually the fact that I think they've accepted that there's no demand for for a an album release, a standard album release as we've known it since the '50s, uh, to be any longer than it is right now. Simply release another CD because there's very I can't think of a single album that is longer than two discs, aside from, you know, someone who might seek a, a compilation or a discography, you know, in which case you just kind of release all those, and then there you go. It's cheap to just kind of keep the technology where it's at, because if you move that along, then you're asking people to buy new uh, n- new media readers. And besides, cloud storage is cheap. Everybody gets... What six gigs on the one drive for free? Exactly. Just by signing well, up. Well, the reality is also with the advent of MP3s and the cloud and MP3 players, they have no reason to move along right. because because for example, if people want space, they can get it, and they won't use removable media. Right. For example, I'm an audiophile. I like music. Duh. You're listening to this podcast. You knew that already. The point is, I have a uh, 180 gig iPod. I can. F- I have currently on my iPod my entire digital library of over six thousand songs on my iPod. That's my entire digital 6, 000, library. You could fit a hell of a lot more than six thousand on one hundred eighty gig. Right. That's nothing. But, but that's what I have right now. That's most of my CDs. Not all of them. I have over a thousand CDs. The reality is, I'm a nutcase who needs my entire library with me at all times. Most music listeners don't do that, but I do. We, of course, grew up in the generation where that was the norm. I do believe the future is headed in, in, in such a way where that's not See, going but to be I demanded. Didn't, I didn't grow up in... I'm, I'm growing up now in a place where that was the norm. But all through high school, I still only had a CD player. And junior high school, I only had a CD player. I could bring three CDs, maybe five, if I had a CD book with me. So that's why I find the need to carry my entire library on me. Because... My limits know no bounds. I can listen to whatever I want, wherever I want, whenever I want. Of course, and that's always what people seek, I think, in some extent. And that's Which why, is why, again, people accept the iPod as, where you, as the, the, the medium in which you're going to do that. But I just want to rewind because there's, there's a twist here with what we're talking about, and that is the fact that, no, CDs aren't screwing themselves over. I think the standard, that the reason, the fact that we have removable media and that it's still a staple of existence right now is really kind of ruining the fact that we don't have longer longer forms of music because no artist or no label, specifically the music labels, want to release longer tracks because they know that, granted, of course, they can give it to a digital audience, an audience that has their 100 gig iPods or, or, or even more, digital libraries, of course, know no bounds. But they know they won't be able to release it to the CD, to the removable media community, which is still very, very prevalent at this point. Well, so in a sense, that's why we really haven't moved beyond the standard 50-year average of the length of an album. Well, yeah. Well, that's also because the, the, the music studios and the big music producers are trying to grasp onto whatever hold they still have less. The reality is more and more musicians are self-produced released on the internet I guarantee if there's a band that you like and you want to hear their album you don't have to go to iTunes you don't have to steal it you go to Bandcamp look it up it's there 90% of artists especially local artists use Bandcamp because and the rest use YouTube right but the True, re- but these are the hardcore fans that spe- that, that seek the um, uh, the esoteric productions of those particular artists which obviously we now consider anything longer than a standard album length to be pretty esoteric. It's wait, not wait, commonly wait, wait. done. Here's question. Most artists don't want to exclude uh, their their audiences in such a way. What's a standard 
length of an album. We're generally talking anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Less. I would argue that 45 minutes is the outside edge nowadays. Yeah, it's 30 to 45 minutes, absolutely. If we go back and look at the albums we reviewed, especially the pop albums, it's more between 30 and 45. Um, I would say an hour. I'm, I'm, I, I give hour is the outside. Yeah, I think same that, is true for movies. Personally, movies? I think that's moved. That's moved um, a little bit beyond. I think the average these days. Maybe that would be true for the '80s and the '90s. The '80s and '90s, yes, definitely hovering around a half an hour. But uh, eh, I mean, even then, you could fit 45 minutes on an, on a on a on a 33 record, no problem. Well, you can fit up to an hour and 20 minutes it. on a, oh, you on a CD. Yeah. Right. Well, on a CD. Oh, on a CD, okay. On a, on a 700 meg CD, if you do it by minutes, by MP3 track by track, with little gap between, or no gap at all, you can fit about an hour and 20 minutes. Right, well, this is not about talking exact figures here. I mean, in general, we all kind of know intuitively what a standard album length is, even though it varies within that framework. It still demands that much of your time. I just And for an album person, that is no problem. That is no problem problem at all we we don't care because we like to hear the 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 fuller broader things that an artist has to say as opposed to this quick snapshot of three minutes you know but at the same time i mean even i I would argue that as far as artists go even when they were on records albums were longer in fact there was a lot of artists that routinely put out Two vinyl albums as an album. That's yeah, that's nothing. That's, that's the equivalent of, of a double disc now, if not even less. I mean, I they may have, have appeared hours. longer for the time because they grew up in the time where that was probably the longest media you could possibly obtain. But I, I think in reality, no. There's this. There's no possible way that it would have been uh, longer back then. That's simply not the case. You I think can hold really, more on a CD than you can hold on a single obviously, vinyl. Obviously, obviously, but uh, it's. I distinctly remember most of my albums being upwards of 45 minutes. Most of my favorite albums. I'm, I'm, and looking at nowadays, they seem to all be slown down, going lower than 45. I'm steering this more in the direction of, of... But that also speaks to, like, just the overall length. 45 minutes is an album. That speaks to the whole topic at hand. You're going to give up a third of your album to one song? Well, granted, that's... That's, um, that's the thing. That's here. what we're looking at here with... with, with with today's album, and yes, we've proven that it doesn't always go well. I want to talk for a little bit just about the times in which it does go well, and sort of what I'm trying to trying to get to the bottom of here is just what we're looking at over the span of of humanity's acceptance of music in this way. How it's kind of gone through a parabolic shift. I mean, if you go back to this classical era, of course, no one even winced at longer art forms. I think one of the longest art forms that that mass culture has really ever accepted is the opera. The opera standard length, I, I I shit you not, is about four hours. Yep. That's what you were expected to deal with over the course of that time, um, which is probably one reason why opera is very unpopular right now, except within the the closed circle. Doesn't mean there wasn't a lot there, although sometimes there wasn't. Again, it varied; it depended upon context. Either case, it was there was no mass market constriction of of well, the time. And and that's what I was trying to prove with talking about how radio has kind of fallen out to the wayside is now that mass market constriction is less and less a factor unless you're in the pop music industry. Any other industry outside of that more or less has less and less fell to those constrictions because albums are mostly released online, mostly released on disc through direct ways. That's the parabolic shift that I'm talking about. You go from a time in which it was accepted to be long or as long as it needs to be to a time in which removable media demanded it to be shorter and radio culture demanded it to be shorter to a time in which it really doesn't matter anymore because everyone's length of time is limited to whatever they have in their hard drive which is increasingly increasingly increasing <laughs> right and talking to songs that didn't suffer for length i mean even on the lower end below 10 minute mark of automatonic electronic harmonic by steam powered giraffe if that song were any shorter you'd be missing important parts it thrives and survives on its length it and goes through up and flows that if you didn't have that seven minutes you wouldn't get that kind of a, a and flow. That's what I really want to talk about, even though I think I've been saying that about five times now, because that's even more of an interesting facet of this conversation. Is 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 whether longer forms are better? And I think yeah. we've 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 got, touched on this in the past here and there. And I'm not going to say that we're going to come to a definite answer here and whatnot. But I I, I am going to pose the fact that you say it 
that these songs survive on their length is a very interesting word choice because it kind of looks to the way in which we not just listen but divide up our time and devote it to music we lead a lead a linear life so our music has to be linear it needs to pass the span of time we've talked about this before so it's kind of no-brainer that it would be intertwined with that sense of time. We can explore the fleeting, of course, but we can also explore that which takes time to build. Friendships take time to build. Love takes time to build. So it, it seems like these things would naturally be manifested in our music, which is why people who obsess over the longer tracks tend to be really, really obsessive and whatnot. So, again, I return to the question. What's your feelings on this? I feel that music itself has no time constraint. And that the statement of a good idea can be 10 seconds or 10 hours. I mean, it really boils down to the ability of the artist to get his statement. That's true. I, feel- I am going to play devil's advocate really quickly, although I think I want to get your answer first, man. So, uh, your question you're stating is, does the length of a track affect the quality of the music? Is that what you're asking? What was the question you stated? That, that's a more succinct way of, of the way I asked it, yes. Okay, no, it doesn't affect it. The reason I say it with such definite is because, more along the lines what John's saying, length has nothing to do with the quality of a song. The artistic idea has to do with the quality of the song. Even though I'm saying that uh, that Steam Power Giraffe song survives on its length, it's because I couldn't imagine it being shorter because it's a concise and created idea. However, if it was a different song, like Juju, or Juju B, or whatever the hell Juju that Juju Magic. Juju Magic. That song is a lot shorter because it's a very simplistic song and it ain't longer and it would drone. Well, naturally, that viewpoint is right where we started. The concept of, of it just depends on the art. You need however long you need and it's just a matter of, of, of if you can bracket it well or not. But I, I am going to pose the devil's advocate here to my own point now and that is simply being concise being poignant this is also something that we value pretty heavily in our art because if you're not concise and if you're not poignant then you're rambling and then it's then it's hard to really accept whether your idea is in some sense pure on the flip side, we're always complaining about how <laughs> I just I did the flip w- side no, no, this is the flip side to your argument oh boy uh, we're always saying, oh, this would have been great if they expanded it. This idea could have done so much more if they made it bigger. Granted. So, yeah, being concise is great, but if you get too concise, well, then you're just shortening it. All right, you're better You're changing it. Better, better question, then. Have you, do you know any brilliant one-minute tracks? Yes, um, that emotional track from, um, um, what was the instrumental band that we listened to? Um, no. It was. I, I got something better. It w- it wasn't Boards of Canada. What was the band that we listened to? Evergreen. Who did Evergreen? That song. Uh, oh, Evergreen Scale by Scale the Summit. Scale the Summit. Migration. That song was a minute and a half or a minute and fifteen. Was something it really like that. that short. Uh, or f- it was no, very that's short. That's fascinating. A fascinating observation because that was one of the uh, tracks that, as I recall, you know how we're always talking about yeah. how, it, how, it, how a track does not feel its length, right? This that was the exact fact. opposite. I felt like that was an, a, a minute and a half. That that drew on the way I, I I could experience a movie, and also when we reviewed Tears on Tape by him, that also had a short, concise interlude that you said was perfect at its length, and it was very short—a minute, minute and a half. Which was that again? Uh, t- <coughs> him, Tears on Tape. I don't remember the name of the track, but in the middle there was an instrumental air that. interlude that you personally was your favorite track, and it was on the shorter side, but it was concise and no. Nope. I got Trump. I got Trump. It's not right. nothing to trump. These no, are I true got a, statements. I got a trump card, like the best. You love short Evergreen song. too. Shut up. No, <laughs> the best short song of all time. Oh, Her Majesty. Best. Her Majesty's pretty nice girl. Or something. Yeah, that. Yeah, the end of Abbey Road. The final thing the Beatles ever gave the world as a band. I don't think it has that point as, as Evergreen personally. But now we're just talking about personal tastes. In any case, um, all right. That's a, that's a sufficient. As a period on the the statement of what the Beatles were, I, I it's it's an amazing choice. Well, I take this in in, in one last direction. That simply, 
simply the fact that it's this. You you do expect then that in the next fifty years or so, or perhaps a lot less, we're going to see a a, a, a no holds barred free for all in terms of how long nope tracks are. No, nope. I don't think it's going to change much. The the reality is, even though <laughs> how contrary. It's not contrary. That's what we said, no. It, it's not contrary, because the reality is, even though there are no time constraints from the radio or anything else, we know that art evolves slowly, unless really extreme. And the reality of someone breaking the boundaries of a song construction and making a quality song that lasts 20 minutes is unlikely. Because still, the the basic, the most basic construction because it's of so challenging. The most, yes, the that's mo- really the only difference, I suppose. Yes. The most, as things get the most basic construction of a song, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, relies on a shorter scheme. Because if you verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, it gets it gets repetitive and boring. So those longer songs are more complicated to construct. I will agree, however, that in an inner age, we'll have more operatic style. Songs, albums that are longer and constant tracks in one album. I would very much because you can concept Concepts. album. I mean, if you take Shape of the Dark Lord's new record, that was a concept album. It had skits between it, and it's one cohesive, solid story. It's not one song, but it's one story. Yeah, and we're gonna get more of that. I think. I, think... I do believe we're already getting more of that. In, oh yes, in, yes, just based on the themes that we we derive from our even albums. Katie I don't believe Perry, even Kid Perry yeah. had not. We are moving from from the point where compilation. Uh, Albums as they existed back in like the fifties aren't really accepted too much because people like the stronger art form. They like the broad art form of forty-five minutes. Granted, not their individual tracks to be forty-five minutes, but the album is something that any artist can do over that span. I think the biggest shift, and now we won't be getting twenty-minute averages, but I think the biggest shift will be pop will stay its short time frame. For a while. Yeah, probably forever. What's popular will probably stay there. But the average song is probably going to be pushing five minutes within the next, you know, 20 years even. Like the average, just true average song. Well, these are like little splitting hairs and whatnot. I do, I am talking, I'm talking very general. That's about a two minute difference from, say, 10 years ago. Granted. And I, but of course I am talking very general, and yes, these are like grand averages that I'm talking about. But generally, Matt, your your stance is that the the average, um, the, the preconception of the standard track length is not going to change much much from our our general mindset. I don't think so. Just because we're, t- we're because also, of what artists are comfortable doing, and, and because of, what of the way we're are. taught music. I imagine in school they teach you at least on a basic level right. that songs last a certain amount of time, they go through a certain amount of refrains, and that's something that's still taught that way. Until they start teaching, well, you have the freedom to do all of this, you know, I just, I think it's it's just like a basic grammar education. They give you the basics, and then it's what you do with the tools, and I don't think we've hit that mark yet where someone's going to take it and make there's it also, this huge thing. There's also one other thing that will never return, um, and I mean, I don't, it, it, it's in some sense sad that it won't, but it's an inevitable fact that recorded music is the staple of life yeah. and as we as we moved into that we did lose something and that was the the fragility of music and how 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 it it really isn't always a part of your life it can't be always a part of your life because you're limited to whether you can play and and who you know who can play or who you can visit who can play that was the fact of life back then it was the fact of life prior to the 19th century that is probably the single reason as to why music even became longer is the fact that people derived their music exclusively from concerts. Yeah. That was their main source. So think about that. How much of a chip would that be if you went to a concert and you got three minutes and you had to leave? Who wants to do that? You go to a concert to spend an evening there. This is why the symphony was invented. The opera, the sonata, the concerto... This is why all these long forms that, you know, certain people who aren't familiar with classical or, or might groan at classical, the reason they groan is for those reasons, is because they're so long. But, of course, if you think about it in the concert setting, it's really not that impossible to imagine. We may never get that again, because now we're only looking at removal of the media, and it's, it's a matter of individual taste at this point. And I do believe at record labels, regardless of whether you can keep long tracks or not, whether you can store them, I believe they're always going to, to sort of seek to get as many people on board as possible, and that will always be sort of 
something average and 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 safe and digestible. Three to six minutes. <sighs> Probably, yes. Fair enough. I think it's time for our spam email of the week. We go from that discussion into our spam. But of course you do well, really you do mean logic. you it's do mean next... our, our, our weekly fan mail, right? You gotta remember, Steve, right. it is the next logical step in the evolution of this podcast. That it is. That it is. He smiled at that. I made him smile. Yet Clash of Clans Hack Tool No Survey is definitely crunchy on the outside, but smooth in the middle. You won't have this option if you have continuously saved your progress in the same place. I shall provide the final word to superstar Y. Clef Garfunkel. At first, I used to be afraid. I was petrified. By Clash of Clans Hack 2014. I thought they were going to start doing... Well, hey, at least they're quoting song lyrics now. They're getting closer to I know. interest. Eh? I was hoping you'd pick up on that, right? Of course I'd pick up on that. I wouldn't well, it miss... was your enunciation. That's also true. You, you, you did bring attention to it. And now, and now that that's not, out of the way, not. thank God. Uh, Steve? What's your album pick for next week? Next week, stu- tune in for episode 97, as I will be the bringing you next, uh, next week's album. And this is Shrink Dust by Chad Vangelin. Chad Vangelin is yet another band that, or, well, artist, solitary artist with some backing, although I do believe he does a lot of it himself. And he did one of my favorite albums by him, Skeleton Connection, which was actually kind of a compilation in its own right, which very, may well have been accidental in terms of in terms of unifying those tracks together, it had this, it had this, this, this aura to it, this aesthetic to it, uh, the aesthetic that I don't really find too many other places. Might have had to do with where he's from. I believe he's from Calgar- Calgary, Alberta. In the Canadia. Yeah, in the Canadias. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't I actually know that artist, so I look forward to. I absolutely either. love that album. I'm curious to see what he's doing now, as he was sort this of starting a- out back in those days. I want to see where he is as a mature artist. Very unique vo- voice. That's my hint of the week. Okay, well, we'll, well see. I'm going to find gonna... out tomorrow exactly what it sounds like, because I'll just listen to it. That's Very well. true. Um, as always, thanks for listening, guys. Um, check us out on all of the social medias, which are now conveniently in little orange balls on the side of the website. So click through. Follow us on YouTube. We're putting out more content as we go. Um, follow us on Tumblr. Yes. Follow us on Facebook and yes. Twitter. Yes. <laughs> You're just going to mindlessly agree to me? Please lick the orange balls. Yes, lick the orange I balls. I wanted to make them invisible, but they said that oh, the click, the click, 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 click. I'm sorry, click. Yeah, it's all right. You, yeah. you almost had it. Yeah. yeah that's, also, that's we, we, we have a big, a bright, shiny donate button. We're always trying to improve the quality of the podcast. We have made strides in that, and we're always looking to make it better. So if you donate, we will. We will thank you on the air if you put in a donation. And um, also, um, send us requests. Uh, we've gotten a few. We're going to do another this month. The more requests we get, the more we'll do. So please send us your album request for what you want us to review. Old, new, whatever. If it's something that you're interested in or you just want to see us rip apart, go ahead and send us that recommendation either through Facebook, Twitter, or you can email us through the website. And that concludes our longest podcast ever. Bye-bye, guys. And as always, music, music is, is life, life and life is, is good. good. <coughs>